Hello there, and welcome to the supercut of my Lebanese Civil War series. If you want to just jump straight into the history, go ahead and check out the second chapter in the video. It should be at this time code right here. But if you want to listen to my little opening spiel, stay tuned. This series took a very long time to make, and I hope it shows. A lot of research, a lot of filming, a lot of editing, just a lot. And about halfway through the series, YouTube decided to make a huge change to the algorithm and how they're enforcing policies, which kneecapped the series halfway through. And thus, the subsequent installments after the halfway point got significantly fewer views. And then there was all the trouble with monetization and copyright stuff and just so many other little problems going on with it that have taken a long time to resolve. But the video you're watching now is the closest to my original vision that I could make. And so for all of that, I like to thank my patrons for being very patient with me in the making of that series and now this compilation video. And as you watch this video, you'll realize why I decided to wear this same shirt for every installment. It's because I had this video planned so that way I could use movie magic to make it look like it was all intended to be one video, because it was. And so yes, I would like to thank my patrons up front for them supporting me through all of this. And I would like to make more big projects like this, and that's why I'm going to ask you, the audience, here for help. YouTube is not my full-time job. Money-wise, it is at best a part-time side gig, and, well, I would like to dedicate more time to YouTube. I enjoy this more than my regular job, and I would love to keep making videos for you. I love research. I love writing. I'm even starting to like editing a little bit. And I could do so much more of all of that if I was earning more money from the YouTube ventures. Ad revenue goes up and down, sponsors come and go, people don't buy as much merch. You could support the channel and help me make more content and hopefully educational material for you guys to use by becoming a member of the Casual Historian Patreon. Members of the Casual Historian Patreon get access to videos early as well as getting their name and the end credits of videos, as well as getting access to a patrons only Discord server and a number of other perks. And so if you are financially in a position to do so and you feel like you get some real value out of the videos I make, then I would ask that you join the Patreon. You can help make these videos for yourself and for more people to enjoy and learn from. Now, if an ongoing monthly contribution is a little too rich for your blood or you're not ready to make that kind of commitment right now, that's understandable. And that's why there are other options to support the channel as well. We accept one-time donations on PayPal, and you can find that down in the description below if you want to support the channel that way. You can also support the channel by buying merch at casualhistorianstore.com. All the more money I make from there, the less money I have to make from my regular job, which means the more time I can put into making these videos. You could also support the channel by buying me a book. Down in the description below, I have a link to an Amazon wishlist that is filled with books on topics that I want to eventually make videos on. So by buying one of those books, you can help me make a future video. But if you're not in a position to financially do this, then do not feel guilty whatsoever. I will be fine. I have a day job. I have a family and a strong support network that'll support me. And so you don't need to feel guilty about this if you can't. But if you are in a position to help, that would be greatly appreciated. So once again, thanks to all of my patrons and for all of you guys for watching my videos. You're the reason I do this and can even contemplate possibly doing it for a living. So thank you very much. And now on with the feature presentation. The modern world of foreign policy and international relations was born in Lebanon. Terrorism, ethnic cleansing, insurgencies, violent jihad, foreign occupations, and uneasy peace. I am talking about the Lebanese Civil War, fought between who knows how many factions from 1975 to 1990. And all of the geopolitical issues we talk about today began there nearly 50 years ago. The kaleidoscope portrait that has emerged from this period suggests that the conflict in Lebanon has been in fact a complex of several conflicts and that time has heightened the interaction and interdependence of the several components. Nor do the several conflicts lie on a single plane. They are of quite different types, producing a conflict vortex, the elements of which are multidimensional as well as interactive. 
Lebanon went from being the picture of sectarian harmony to a byword for political tragedy. Beirut was once called the Paris of the Middle East. It was a home for political exiles plotting revolutions and a playground for Arab princes looking for debaucherous fun away from their puritanical homes in the Gulf. The only reason it's not talked about more today is because it has been overshadowed by events it arguably set in motion. What exactly was the Lebanese Civil War about anyways? Well, depending on who you ask, you'll get a different answer. A Lebanese Muslim would blame the Maronites for refusing to give up power despite the changing demographics in Lebanon. The Maronites would blame the Palestinians for disrupting that demographic balance and for committing acts of terrorism that forced the Israelis to retaliate. The Palestinians would blame the Israelis for making them refugees in the first place. The Israelis would blame the Arab states for spending their time and resources arming Palestinian terrorists instead of incorporating and assimilating them into their own countries, the way Israel welcomed and incorporated Jewish refugees fleeing Arab states. The Arab states blame the West for Israel and Lebanon even existing, and the West is pulling its hair out shouting, why can't you be normal into the back seat? To fully understand this web of blame, we need to go back but not to just the French mandate. Since Roman times, the mountains of Lebanon have been a refuge for minority religious sects. Among the earliest were the Maronite Christians. They received their name from a 4th century Syriac monk, Saint Maron. In the eyes of the church in Rome and Constantinople, the Maronites were heretics and were initially persecuted by the church, which is what brought them to Mount Lebanon. There they were able to resist Byzantine authority and continue practicing their religion as they saw fit. But this couldn't last forever. Eventually, the area of Mount Lebanon was conquered by Muslims, at which point they became second-class citizens. In the 16th century, they began reaching out to the church in Rome. The Maronites had ceased the teachings that got them labeled as heretics and thus were welcomed back into the Catholic fold. But by this time, the influence of the Catholic Church was waning and they didn't have the power to protect the Maronites from their Muslim overlords. But in the 17th century, they would finally get outside protection when the Ottoman Empire designated France as the protector of the Maronites. This was the birth of political, economic, and ecclesiastical ties between France and the Maronite community. Living alongside them was another religious minority, the Druze. What exactly the Druze are is a complex subject, and if you want to dive deeper into that particular question, I have a couple videos linked in the eye in the upper right hand corner to explain that. But for the purposes of the history of the Lebanese Civil War, we should understand the Druze as a particular sect of Shia Islam and that is how they have been seen in Lebanon. More often than not, it was Sunni Muslims who ruled over Lebanon, even though they were a minority within Lebanon itself. The Sunni Ottomans didn't care about the practices of the Maronites, but they did care about the practices of people who called themselves Muslims, even if they did not consider them Muslims themselves, which meant the Druze always felt on edge. And in order to prove to their Sunni rulers that they were sufficiently Muslim, they practiced even greater violence towards Christians than their Sunni counterparts during times of war. The Maronites owned most of the land in the north, and the Druze owned most of the land in the south, meaning that anyone from one group living in the area of the other was usually a peasant paying rent to someone of the other group. In addition to the Maronites and Druze, you had the Shia, who fell isolated from the bastions of Shia Islam in Iraq and Iran, and having been persecuted by the majority Sunni around them. Throughout the centuries, there were periods of sporadic violence between the Maronites and the Druze. As the Ottomans began losing ground to the Europeans, tensions between the two communities grew. The Druze living in northern Lebanon rebelled against their Maronite landlords in 1858 and won, claiming the rented land as their own. Two years later, the Maronites in the south attempted to do the same, but before they could, the Druze landlords massacred 11,000 of them. This is what prompted intervention by Napoleon III, who sent troops to protect the Maronites. The Ottomans formalized this fait accompli by turning the area of Mount Lebanon into an autonomous province with a Christian governor. The French retained their military presence in Lebanon through the First World War, and during the carve-up of the Ottoman Empire, they were given a League of Nations mandate over both Lebanon and Syria. Now here is where French colonialism starts making the history a little more complicated. Historically speaking, the Ottoman Empire, as well as previous Muslim empires, had a province named either Syria or Damascus. And this province usually encompassed most of modern-day Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, West Bank, and Gaza, often referred to as Greater Syria. But this territory was split between the French and the British. So already, half of Greater Syria was cut off. But the French would go a step further. 
The French played favorites. The Maronites were privileged over the Druze or other ethnic or religious groups. They were the ones allowed to start businesses and keep out competitors, which usually meant non-Maronites. The French could have carved up its mandate into smaller realms for each ethnic or religious group, but they feared that a Maronite state consisting only of the territory occupied by the Maronites would not be economically viable, and they were probably right. So they enlarged the former Emirate of Lebanon to include territory occupied by Sunni Arabs in order to give Lebanon some usable farmland. The people living in this farmland, however, had more economic and social ties to the rest of Syria than to Mount Lebanon. The former ruling class of Ottoman Syria believed Lebanon should be subservient to them, and this population would serve as a thorn in the side of any faction trying to control Lebanon, because their loyalties never lied with the idea of a greater Lebanon. For the French, Lebanon was to become an outpost of French culture and economic interests in the Near East, and combat the rise of Arab nationalism in Syria. They helped the Lebanese draft a republican constitution, which greatly resembled France's own. They had a parliament which elected a president, and the president would appoint a prime minister and a cabinet to run the government. The constitution was supposed to go into effect in 1932 with its first scheduled election, but it was called off by the French. The campaign saw a rise in sectarian tension, and the French feared a civil war would break out, so they cancelled the elections. The constitution would be reinstated four years later after a leftist government was elected in France, who then allowed the election to go ahead. The Maronite, Emile Ed, would win in 1936. World War II would briefly halt Lebanon's practice of democracy when the Vichy regime suspended the constitution. An allied invasion in 1941 drove the Vichy loyalists out of Lebanon and the Free French were able to assert control, restoring the constitution in 1943. With help from the British, they negotiated a political settlement between the various Christian and Muslim factions that divided up the seats in government between the sectarian groups, giving each a piece of the government that was theirs to dominate. Each department became a fiefdom, serving the interests of the faction that controlled it, which meant nepotism and corruption became rampant. The Christians and Muslims wouldn't receive equal power in this government, because the population size of the different groups wasn't equal. They based this division on a census taken before the 1932 elections, which calculated the Christian population to be about 54% and Muslims accounting for the other 46. This agreement would allot the Muslims five seats in parliament for every six Christian seats. The parliament gets to elect a president who gets to serve a single six-year term. The prime minister and all the cabinet officials are appointed by the president. This agreement, referred to as the National Compact, gave the Maronites a monopoly on the presidency. The Sunnis, despite being the smallest faction, were given a monopoly on the prime ministership. The Speaker of Parliament would be given to a Shia, and the Deputy Speaker and Deputy Prime Minister would be Greek Orthodox Christians, and the Chief of the General Staff of the Military would be a Druze. Along with the division of offices in government, the National Compact also incorporated other political compromises. Muslim leaders agreed to drop their demands for unification with Syria. The Christians agreed that Arabic would be the official language. They both agreed not to seek outside arbitration over domestic political questions and to present themselves to the world as an Arab country. Some Muslims rejected the National Compact and were therefore never on board with the balance of power set up by it. The more internationally inclined, such as Pan-Arabists, Communists, and Socialists, rejected the pact as well. In addition, foreign powers such as Syria, Egypt, and the Soviet Union wanted to change it in order to take control of Lebanon. But the Maronites and the Western democracies were supporters of the new status quo. They would hold their last election under French occupation in 1943, with the Maronite Bekara Kauri elected president. The French would fully pull out of Lebanon in 1946. Kauri would be re-elected in 1949, but he was pressured to resign in 1952 over corruption charges. With the office open, Parliament elected the Maronite Camille Chamon to fill the presidency. Chamon had been a member of the Socialist National Front, which was a predominantly Muslim party, but he would pursue neither socialist nor Muslim interests while in office, being more interested in foreign affairs and how Arab nationalism was becoming a threat to the political status quo. Arab nationalism was on the rise in the region. The creation of Israel in 1958 triggered the flight of Arab Palestinians, while most of the Arab states all sent forces to try and wipe out the new Jewish state. We saw similar instances after the overthrow of Western-backed monarchs, as well as with Nasser nationalizing the Suez Canal. These events triggered a radicalism in the region. The Arabs are one people, and must be made one state, and all of their ire was targeted at Israel. Well, 
most of it. The intellectuals of the Pan-Arabist movement always tried portraying themselves as a secular nationalist movement, but in practice, on the ground, Pan-Arabism was very heavily bent toward Islam. In the mind of your average Arab nationalist, you could not be both a good Arab and a good Christian, because as a Christian, you would always be culturally and politically guided towards the West. And they kind of had a point, especially when it came to the Maronites. The Maronites had built up ties to the Catholic Church in France, not just prior to independence, but prior to French rule. And the French privileged them during colonial rule, and they still looked to France for economic and cultural guidance. But let's keep something in mind. In the Middle East, there were only three countries where Christians were equal under the law to the majority population. And Lebanon was the only Arab country where this was the case. For the prior 1300 years, the region was ruled and dominated by Muslim powers, who relegated Christians and Jews to becoming second-class citizens. You had to pay a special tax for the privilege of not converting to Islam. Muslims were forbidden to convert to any religion under penalty of death. Construction of new churches and synagogues was forbidden, and you always had the threat of ethnic cleansing hanging over your head. The reason the French got into Lebanon in the first place was to protect the Maronites from genocide. So yes, it was really hard to be a good Arab and a good Christian, but that's because being a good Arab meant not being a Christian. In spite of the spread of Pan-Arabism, President Shaman thought that the status quo of Lebanon was a model of stability. While all the other countries in the region were witnessing coups and assassinations, the worst Lebanon saw was a politician resign over corruption charges. All things considered, things were pretty good. Shimon kept relations with the West open, despite calls from Muslims in the cabinet and parliament to cut ties with Britain and France after the Suez Crisis. Within the international community, and especially in the US, Nasser was seen not only as being in the Soviet camp, but in some cases as being Moscow's puppet. Thus, countries that felt threatened by Egypt would qualify for US aid under the Eisenhower Doctrine, to which President Shimon signed up, and this would prove decisive in Lebanon's first civil war. Since independence, the constitution only allowed presidents to serve a single six-year term. But Shaman wanted to seek re-election. He plotted to rig the 1957 parliamentary elections so he could amend the constitution to allow him to run again. He did this by running pro shaman candidates for Muslim seats in parliament. And he was able to oust several prominent Muslim MPs with help from the CIA, who contributed funds for the campaign. There are disputes over how involved the CIA actually was in this election or the following civil war, but there's little dispute over the fact that they helped fund opposition campaigns. If arms could not buy loyalty in the Middle East, the almighty dollar was still the CIA's secret weapon. Cash for political warfare and power plays was always welcome. If it could help create an American imperial in Arab and Asian lands, Foster was all for it. The pro chamon faction won 53 of the 66 seats in Parliament, and the seeds for civil war were planted with it. On May 8, 1958, a liberal Maronite journalist, Nassib Metni, was assassinated. He had served time in prison for criticizing President Chamon, and he was suspected of ordering his death. Anti-government protests erupted in Tripoli, killing 35 people. The SNF orchestrated nationwide labor strikes and demanded the president's resignation. Chamaung declared a state of emergency and mobilized the army, and the SNF responded by forming militias. The Maronite Phalanges Party would begin forming its own militias in support of President Chamaung. Barricades were set up around Beirut. The leader of the SNF, Kamal Jumblat, had been one of the Muslim politicians ousted in the election the year prior. He would set up his own government in the Druze-controlled town of Mukhtara, and built up a 2,000-man militia that battled with the Phalangist militias led by Pierre Gamayal. The Lebanese army, led by Faud Chahab, was hesitant to intervene for fear of turning Muslims further against the government, so he only did so when the government was directly threatened. On July 14, 1958, the pro-Western King Faisal II of Iraq was overthrown, which eliminated Chamon's only ally in the region. This forced him to request military aid from the U.S., who sent in 10,000 Marines. By this point, the SNF had about a third of the country under their control at the time, and were angry at the use of a foreign army to intervene. The civil war fizzled out, with both sides agreeing to let General Chahab run for president unopposed. As president, Fal Chahab attempted to bridge the divide between the Maronites and Muslims by blending Christian identity with Arab nationalism. 
He tried to modernize Lebanon's administration and politics, which was riddled with nepotism and patronage. He would use parts of the government that were filled by appointment, such as the bureaucracy and military intelligence, to suppress and undermine those that stood in his way. He practiced a moderately pro-Nasser foreign policy in order to dissuade Muslims from violent revolution, while the Maronites wanted Lebanon to remain a pro-Western Christian nation. He also began a program of infrastructure projects, in particular roads, which connected poor rural regions to economically dynamic urban areas, which resulted in the migration of poor Shias to Beirut, who settled around the Palestinian refugee communities. The 1964 presidential election saw Chahab's hand-picked successor, Charles Halou, win the presidency. Unfortunately, Halou lacked a political base of his own, which left him a weak and ineffectual leader. He continued the foreign policy of Chahab, which sought to unify the country and the region against Israel. But again, foreign events would influence the attitudes of Lebanese Muslims. Since 1949, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria all participated in arming Palestinian terrorists, or Fedayeen, who were then sent off to attack targets in Israel. At the time, Israel had a policy of holding its neighbors politically responsible for these attacks, and thus would militarily retaliate against them. The Arab governments, especially Syria, would use this policy against them. An uneasy truce between the war and states prevailed until 1965. The next year, a new radical government in Syria increased terrorist raids against Israel, sending Arab guerrillas across the borders of Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. Syria's goal was twofold, to force Israeli reprisals against Jordan and Lebanon, thereby helping to weaken or destroy the moderate pro-Western governments of those countries, and to bring on war. The prelude to the Six-Day War of 1967 was identical to the prelude of the Sinai Campaign. Terrorist gangs as actively encouraged and supported by President Nasser as the Fedayeen has been in the 50s were operating against Israel from both the Gaza Strip and Jordan. They included a new organization founded in 1965 known as El Fatah, which under Yasser Arafat's leadership subsequently became the most powerful and well-publicized element in the Palestine Liberation Organization. The Syrians seemed bent on an escalation of the conflict. They kept up an endless bombardment of the Israeli settlements below the Golan Heights, and Israeli fishermen and farmers faced what was sometimes virtually daily attacks by snipers. Helu's decision not to join the Arab states in the Six-Day War angered the Muslim population, and the subsequent influx of Palestinian refugees allowed the PLO to enter Lebanon and spread throughout the refugee camps. Palestinian organizations began orchestrating attacks on Israel from within Lebanon. Lebanese Christians saw the migration of Palestinians into Lebanon as a foreign subversion into Lebanese culture and politics, and opposed it. Lebanese Muslims welcomed them into Lebanon and saw aiding them and their cause as a religious duty. The already faint Christian pan-Arabist movement was growing weaker as more and more questioned whether the two could be reconciled. President Shahab had tried to mend the two together, but the influx of Palestinians into Lebanon posed a threat to the demographic balance within the country. If the Palestinians were ever given citizenship and the parliament ever reapportioned seats according to a new census, the Maronites feared losing everything. Not just their privileges given to them prior to independence, but their basic rights as well. In the 1968 parliamentary elections, an alliance was formed between Pierre Gemayal's Phalangists, former President Chamon's National Liberals, and the National Bloc, led by Raymond Ed, the son of Lebanon's first president. They argued that allowing the Palestinians and the PLO to continue operating in Lebanon was a national security risk. The Muslims were right about the Maronites not wanting to lose power, but the Maronites would prove to be right about the Palestinians as well. In 1968, Palestinian terrorists in Beirut attacked planes from the Israeli airline Al El, to which Israeli commandos responded by destroying several planes at the Beirut International Airport. Radical Lebanese parties called a general strike to protest the government's incompetence, which resulted in the resignation of the Prime Minister. The raid had been part of Israel's long-standing policy regarding Fedayeen attacks, both of which would become more common after the Six-Day War. In the north, there was also no peace. Southern Lebanon was gradually being turned into a playground for the terrorists. Israeli towns, villages, and farms, even school buses filled with children, were regularly being shelled and fired upon from what was now nicknamed Fatahland. 
while the Lebanese government wept crocodile tears and said it could do nothing about the activity of the terrorists or even the fact that they were trained and operating from Lebanese territory. The Lebanese army began to engage the Palestinian fighters hiding in Lebanon near the borders with Israel and Syria. Pro-Palestinian protests broke out in Beirut, which resulted in a state of emergency being declared. As fighting between the Lebanese army and the Palestinians continued, other Arab countries protested. Nasser offered to negotiate between the two. An accord was signed on November 3, 1969. The details were initially kept secret, but leaked in April 1970. The leak revealed that the PLO was allowed to govern the refugee camps and were allowed to establish armed units inside them, along with certain transit routes in southern Lebanon. The 1970 presidential election saw Elias Sarkisk, one of the last Jihadists, run against Suleiman Frangia, who won by a single vote in parliament. When he got into office, he purged all of the Chahabists from the government, including in the army and military intelligence. The latter ended up crippling the Lebanese army's ability to prevent the PLO from orchestrating terror attacks, which inevitably resulted in more Israeli retaliations. The Arab states went on giving the terrorists money, arms, and backing, and then screaming to high heaven whenever we made clear by raiding the terrorist bases in Syria and Lebanon that we held the governments of those states responsible for what was happening. In September 1970, the Jordanian army had bloody clashes with the PLO, which resulted in the expulsion of the PLO from Jordan, referred to as Black September. Many would go into exile in Lebanon, and the PLO would relocate their headquarters to Beirut. This sparked a surge in anti-Israeli attacks from Palestinians in Lebanon, which was followed by increased Israeli retaliation. Jordan learned, as did Lebanon six years later, that countries that harbor guerrillas run enormous risks. They are in constant danger of losing control over their destinies because others determine the question of war and peace for them. If the guerrillas grow sufficiently powerful, they sooner or later seek to replace the authority of the host government. On April 10, 1973, a raid in Beirut by Israeli commandos killed three Al-Fatah leaders. The funerals turned into riots. A state of emergency was declared. The president claimed he wouldn't allow a Black May to happen in Lebanon, but neither would he allow the Palestinians to act like an occupying army. The army and the PLO clashed in May 1973, when the army began besieging the Palestinian camps. Leftist and Nasserite militias would fight alongside the PLO. In response, Syria had closed its border to Lebanon. The central government didn't have as much control over the rural areas of Greater Lebanon, and Syria closing its border made governing these areas even more difficult. On May 17th, a new agreement was reached between the Lebanese government and the Palestinians, known as the Melkart Protocols. Newspapers at the time reported that it altered the Cairo Agreement from 1969, but in reality, it reaffirmed it. The army would lift its blockade, which opened up access routes for Syria to arm the Palestinians. And once again, this resulted in an uptick of Palestinian terror attacks against Israel. Lebanon was disintegrating. We held emergency meetings to review contingency plans should the open civil war break out. Among our friends, told us either directly or through envoys of their despair at the growing radicalization of the region. In 1973, a new prime minister, Taki al-Din Sol, was appointed and formed a new cabinet. It managed to satiate Assad by appointing several pro-Syrian Muslims to the cabinet. When the Yom Kippur War broke out in 1973, Lebanon was officially neutral, but it allowed Syria to use its radar stations and gave access to its fuel supplies. The Palestinians in Lebanon also participated by attacking northern Israel with guerrilla raids, along with artillery and rocket fire. Israel wasn't able to retaliate against the PLO due to the IDF being split between northern and southern fronts. The Lebanese government supported the Palestinian efforts in hopes they would create a Palestinian state and finally get out of Lebanon. Ultimately, the Israelis were able to prevail, but with a much smaller margin of victory. Lebanese Muslims, swept up in the pride of Arab successes on the battlefield, were no longer content with Christian dominance of the government. The war resulted not only in a resurgence of Arab pride, but of Islamic pride as well, which would begin to compete with each other. It also shifted European interests in the region from protecting minorities to appeasing the Arab majorities, which meant they were no longer concerned with preserving Christian power in Lebanon. This resulted in the Maronites turning more towards Israel as a backer, and because the Maronites were increasingly anti-Palestinian, the Israelis obliged. The city of Beirut was more and more becoming a microcosm of the country as a whole. The capital was divided largely along religion and class, 
The western half of the city was filled with poor Muslims, while the eastern half was populated with wealthy Maronite Christians. The eastern outskirts of the city were populated with Palestinian refugees and Shia migrants. The Muslims of Beirut had been radicalized after the Yom Kippur War, which not only posed a threat to the Christian authorities of Lebanon, but to the Muslim authorities that had cooperated with them. Muslims began shifting their allegiances to newer, more radical political parties and militias. Christian parties began arming their militias through local purchases and Western allies, while the Palestinians were being armed by Syria, Iraq, and Libya. By the early 1970s, the demographics of Lebanon had shifted. Estimates from the time claimed that Christians had gone from 54% of the population down to 46, and Muslims the inverse. The Shias had become the largest individual sect in Lebanon, outnumbering the Maronites. They were led by Imam Musa Sadr, who criticized the government for its failure to protect Shias in southern Lebanon from Israeli attacks. Sadr was born in Iran and arrived in Lebanon in 1957. He had been a supporter of Ruhollah Khomeini in the 1963 protests, which resulted in him losing his Iranian citizenship. He formed the Shia Communal Council in 1967, in which he became the spokesperson for the Shia of Lebanon, and like everyone else, they were forming their own militias and received aid from foreign powers. In particular, the Shia in Lebanon looked to Syria's new leader, Hafez al-Assad, due to him being from the Alawite sect of Shia Islam. As Lebanon continued to destabilize, the Israelis needed more than just airstrikes and commando raids. In 1974, the Israelis began setting up checkpoints and roadblocks in southern Lebanon in order to stop the movement of Palestinian terrorists into Israel. The Lebanese government was unable to stop it, in large part due to the growth of these militias. The impending collapse of Lebanon was also brought on by the geopolitics of foreign powers, but not the ones you're thinking of. Since Nasser's death in 1970, Syria and Egypt were competing over leadership of the Arab world. Hafez al-Assad had come to power that year, and wanted to develop his own base of power in the region through the strength of the Syrian military and exerting influence over Jordan, Lebanon, and the Palestinians. The early 1970s saw Syria's first sustained period of political stability since the French Mandate, and they had numerous political interests in Lebanon. The Syrian regime didn't officially recognize the independence of Lebanon and laid claim to most of its territory. They also feared that Israel might use Lebanon to outflank Syrian defenses in the event of a future war. He was also interested in the Shia of Lebanon and wanted to use Musa al-Sadr to give him and his Alawite regime an air of legitimacy. In the event of a war, he expected to have the support of Lebanon's Shia, some of the Palestinian organizations, at least half of the Lebanese Ba'ath Party, as well as urban workers. To that end, Syria had intervened in the 1972 parliamentary elections in Lebanon, but the final death knell would come in 1975. All sides began building up their own militias separate from the Lebanese military in order to protect their communities. So when fighting broke out in April 1975, everyone was prepared. Funding for the civil war came from many sources. Both the Palestinians and Maronites had diaspora communities who sent remittances back to their homelands, or generally donated to various organizations disguising themselves as charities in the West. By 1975, the PLO's budget was bigger than that of the Lebanese government, and the economic activity of the Palestinians made up about 15% of Lebanon's GDP. There was also plenty of money pouring in from the Gulf monarchies, who were flush with cash due to the spike in oil prices after the embargo during the Yom Kippur War. Many Lebanese also worked abroad in the Gulf, sending home both money and ideas. In February 1975, Muslim fishermen went on strike in Sidon against a new company owned by former President Kamil Shamon. The mayor of Sidon, Marouf Saad, was a leader in the protest, but he was assassinated by unknown assailants. Riots erupted in Sidon, with the Muslims blaming the Maronites for Saad's death. The government responded by deploying troops to restore order, but this exacerbated the problem. Gunfights broke out between the soldiers and the protesters, who were aided by Palestinian fighters from a nearby camp. In March, Christian parties began demonstrating in support of the government and the army. Muslims saw the army as a tool of the Maronites and therefore not trustworthy of arbitrating internal conflicts, and saw the Christian demonstrations as further evidence of this. This resulted in Muslims rationalizing their support for their own militias and the PLO. And on April 13th, 1975, Phalangist leader Pierre Gamayal was attending the consecration of a new Maronite church in a Christian part of Beirut. A car pulled up and gunfire came out, killing four people, including Gamayal's bodyguard. 
Phalange's party militias assume this attack came from the Palestinians, who were celebrating a successful terror attack in Israel with a parade at Camp Shatila in West Beirut. That afternoon, a busload of Palestinians coming home from the parade passed by the church where the attack on Gamayal had occurred that morning. Phalange's militia at the church ambushed the bus, killing 27 and injuring 19. As word of both the assassination attempt and the bus massacre spread across Beirut, Phalange's militias and PLO began to clash. President Suleiman Frangia met with Hafez al-Assad to discuss how to stop the Israeli attacks. At no point did they ever discuss getting the PLO to stop attacking Israel, which was by design. The Cairo Agreement of 1969, signed by President Charles Hulu and Gamal Abdel Nasser, forced Lebanon to give de facto sovereignty to the Palestinian camps. On the ground, this meant that the PLO became the governing body over the camps. They guarded them, recruited fighters, and kept Lebanese law enforcement out. You see, the Israelis weren't the only ones the PLO were attacking. PLO gangs also attacked Lebanese citizens as well as foreigners in the country. One must admit that the Palestinians themselves, by violating the Lebanese law and carrying arms and functioning in a police role at the entrances of the capital, have facilitated the preparation and conception of the conspiracy. In certain cases, Palestinian patrols used to arrest government employees and director generals to check their identification, and in other cases, Lebanese and foreign residents were kidnapped and imprisoned. These violations taken lightly at first became unbearable. Palestinians should have collaborated with the Lebanese authorities so that lawbreakers who take refuge in the Palestinian camps cannot escape the law. Had there not been this degree of transgression or violation of law, we would not have seen this level of outrage. The Christians grew particularly angry at the Palestinians because they did not remain neutral in Lebanon's politics. Previously, we used to resort to political pressure only, as the only means for reform and equity. Then the Palestinian cause emerged, and we found ourselves united with the Palestinians, because together we form one ideology. We and the Palestinians are one in terms of Arab identity, religion, and nationalistic views. The Christians weren't the only ones angry at the Palestinians. The Shia who lived in the Bekaa Valley in southern Lebanon also suffered from the Israeli retaliations. Musa Sadr urged the Lebanese state to redress the plight of the southern Lebanese, but to little effect. As an Iranian trying to make headway in an Arab environment, he found it expedient to publicly and repeatedly declare his antipathy toward Israel and his support for the right of the Palestinians to win back their homeland. Yet despite his declarations and genuine feelings of sympathy for the Palestinians, Sadr could see that the actions of the PLO were bringing ruin and misery to his constituents in South Lebanon he found it increasingly difficult to reconcile his sympathies for the stateless Palestinians with the reckless behavior of the PLO in the South. As the fighting spread, the apparatus of government began to fall apart. The Lebanese army and civil service began to fracture along sectarian lines, only defending or servicing their communities. The Israelis backed one of these officers, Saad Haddad, who took control of a Christian enclave along the southern border with Israel which made it easy for the IDF to funnel weapons and supplies to his forces. This became known as the Good Fence Policy. This was not an unusual practice for Israel. They had a history of supporting ethnic or religious minorities against hostile Arab governments. Having supported the Kurds in Iraq, the Yemenites against the Egyptians, as well as the Christians in Sudan against the Arab government in Khartoum. The Israelis felt a kind of kinship with the Christians of Lebanon. They were both ethnic and or religious minorities surrounded by a hostile Arab Muslim majority. Seeing the erosion of their position, the Lebanese Christians took a stand to defend their heritage, while Syria lay in wait to extend its hegemony over Lebanon and realize its dream of a greater Syria. 
In the eyes of the Rabin government, supporting the Maronites in Lebanon was a logical extension of this policy. If it was in Israel's interest to help the Kurds 600 miles away and the Ethiopians over a thousand miles away, no one had any doubt about the need to support the Christians who were fighting for their lives against the PLO on our very doorstep. The first fights were between Palestinian and Phalangist militias in the streets of Beirut, Tripoli, and Sidon. The Palestinians and their Lebanese allies targeted Maronite-owned businesses, while Phalangists targeted the Palestinian camps. There were no firm battle lines, and barricades were hastily thrown up. The Arab League managed to secure a ceasefire on April 16th, but no one knew for how long. Maronite leaders began resigning their positions in President Frangia's government after leaders of the Lebanese National Movement, a coalition of Muslim and leftist factions led by Druze leader Kamal Jumblat, sought to have the army disarm Phalangist militias, while their own militias remained armed. Fighting resumed shortly thereafter, with former President Kamil Chamoun and Kamal Jamblat leading the respective sides. President Frangia tried to get a new government formed, but prime ministers kept resigning. Rashid Karami managed to secure another ceasefire on June 30th, after forming a new cabinet consisting of a member from each major sect. The Maronites wanted to provoke the Palestinians into breaking the ceasefire so they could justify expelling them from the country. Jumblat made sure to place the LNM militias between the Phalangists and the PLO so as to prevent such provocations. In the negotiations, Kamal Jumblat and the LNM demanded that Christians and Muslims have equal representation in parliament, and that confessional monopolies over cabinet offices be abolished. All other reforms were secondary and presumably achievable if the former were achieved. The Maronites, who saw Sunni and Arab populism as threats to their power and rights, opposed these reforms. While the Sunnis, leftists, and Palestinians were fighting against the Maronites, the Shia were putting up a pacifist facade. They had managed to keep their own militias a secret from the others, all the while receiving training from the PLO in cooperation with Syrian officials. Musa al-Sadr had made a big show of protesting the civil war and the militias by going on a hunger strike but a training accident in early July resulted in over 30 casualties amongst Sadr's Amal fighters. He claimed his militias were for protecting the Shia community in southern Lebanon from the Israelis, but nobody was buying it, and Sadr was now seen as a hypocrite. The June 30th ceasefire ended on August 24th, when fighting broke out between Amal and Phalangist in the Beka Valley. August 29th saw fighting break out in Tripoli between the Zagarta Liberation Army and the PLO with Sunni militias. The ZLA was led by Tony Frangia, the son of President Suleiman Frangia. Prime Minister Karami tried to stop the fighting with the Lebanese army, but after it killed Sunni militiamen, the army lost all Muslim support. In response to the death of the militiamen, Kamal Jumblat called for a general strike on September 15th in protest. Jumblat also reached out to Assad for aid, who would send the Palestine Liberation Army to Tripoli. The Palestine Liberation Army, or PLA, were Syrian organized divisions of Palestinian troops and were functionally extensions of the Syrian military. Assad used them when he wanted to pursue Syrian foreign policy goals without dragging Syria itself into war. Hafez sent his foreign minister to Beirut to form a committee to resolve the fighting. The committee agreed to a new ceasefire on September 25th, which broke down on October 22nd and the army was unable to contain the hostilities. Hafez sent in more PLA forces to Beirut in agreement with Prime Minister Karami, but President Frangia opposed this move, fearing it would exacerbate the tensions between the Maronites and the Palestinians, especially when the PLA were so obviously Syrian proxies, and foreigners in Lebanon felt trapped by the interests of outside powers. As the violence reached paroxysm after paroxysm, and the world watched with indifference, or at best revulsion, even while feeding it with more weapons, I have felt as much impatience with what the world as anger at invading armies, local warlords, and anonymous car bombers. Outsiders look at Beirut from a wary distance as though it had nothing to do with them. They speak of Beirut as if it were an aberration of the human experience. It is not. Beirut was a city like any other, and its people were a people like any other. What happened here could, I think, happen anywhere. The Phalanges began to push into the Muslim and mixed neighborhoods of West Beirut, but were pushed back by the LNM. Kidnappings and massacres became common. Militias began attacking Muslims and Christians in downtown Beirut at random. Another ceasefire was accepted on December 15th after military threats were made by Syria and the PLO, 
At this point, both sides began to eliminate hostile areas within their own enclaves. Maronite militias blockaded Palestinian camps and destroyed Muslim slums in East Beirut. Fatah and the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine ended their faux neutrality and formally sided with the LNM. Palestinian and LNM militias attacked Christian towns along the coast. The PLO would be the first to introduce heavy artillery into the fighting, whereas before it consisted mainly of rifle and small arms fire. This forced the Lebanese into bombing the Palestinian positions. Muslim militias from Sidon advanced north to help capture the Christian port city of Jia. The Maronites captured Karantia and Maslak, while the Muslims and Palestinians captured Damour. Most of the Christian residents of that city had fled, but those left behind were massacred. In the more rural areas, Sunni tribesmen raided Christian villages. In Tripoli, the ZLA fought against the Sunni militias and the PLO, and in the Beka Valley, Amal militias and the PLO attacked Christians, and Syria would send more PLA to join them. By 1976, Lebanon was in a virtual state of anarchy. Government buildings were subject to attacks by mobs and arson, inmates were released from prisons, migrants and refugees began to occupy empty homes and apartments in West Beirut. His failure to stem the disintegration resulted in Prime Minister Karami resigning on January 18th. President Frangia asked Syria for help, who were able to establish a new ceasefire on January 21st. That same day, Lieutenant Al-Hitab of the Lebanese army mutinied and formed his own militia, the Lebanese Arab Army, or LAA, which sided with the Muslim and Palestinian militias. In March, the Sunni Brigadier General Aziz al-Adab led a coup against President Suleiman Frangia and demanded that he resigned, but the president refused. At this time, the Christian militias began to organize themselves under a unified command, calling themselves the Lebanese Forces or Lebanese Front, under the leadership of Bashir Jamal, the son of Phalangist leader Pierre Jamal. They began advocating a partition of Lebanon into separate Christian and Muslim states, which the Muslims, Palestinians, and Syrians opposed. The Maronites were receiving support from Maronite businessmen abroad, as well as the pro-American Arab states such as Egypt and Saudi Arabia. The Muslims received their arms from the Syrians, who in turn got them from the Soviets. The Syrians feared that if the civil war dragged on too long, the Israelis might intervene. So when the LAA began besieging the Christian towns of Andaka and al kabaya Assad was asked to intervene by those communities. So the Syrians got President Frangia to sign on to constitutional reforms, which ordered the distribution of seats in parliament be equal between Muslims and Christians, and for the election of prime minister to be handled by parliament, rather than appointed by the president. But to the LNM, these reforms were insufficient. PLO leadership also began to fear the Syrian presence might threaten their autonomy, because despite the PLO and Syria being nominally allies, they both wanted to control Lebanon for themselves. The first objective was to obtain gradually full control over Lebanon by installing certain kinds of puppet rulers who will be in harmony with the Palestinians, the actual rulers. However, another objective evolved while work on the first was going on. Their second objective was to establish a Palestinian homeland, a part of which will be in the south of Lebanon, of a size dependent on the magnitude of their victory over the Lebanese. At this point, the Palestinians and the leftists were winning the civil war in Lebanon. But Assad feared the PLO gaining too much autonomy, because he wanted them to remain dependent on Syria. And this is the real reason for Syria's intervention into the Lebanese civil war. By early April, the LNM-LAA-PLO alliance controlled two-thirds of Lebanon, consisting of all the lowlands added by France during the mandate period. Assad responded by sending in more PLA into Lebanon, and attempted to break up the PLO-LNM alliance, but failed to which he then sent in even more PLA. Assad called on President Frangia to resign, but once again, the president refused. The Maronites reached out to the US for protection, but after Vietnam, the US was in no mood for foreign wars, nor was France, or any country in Western Europe due to their dependence on Arab oil. Since the Yom Kippur War, the Arab states had been using the threat of oil embargoes to get Western countries to cut off support to Israel, and to coerce them into working with the PLO whom the Arab League had declared the only legitimate representative of Palestinian interests in 1974. The Maronites also considered reaching out to Israel, but they knew this would alienate Assad, who was, for the time being, holding the Islamists, Arabists, and Palestinians back from total victory. They reached out to President Frangia and decided to openly endorse the recent constitutional reforms in exchange for his support. 
Now this was supported by Assad, who got the PLA to switch sides to the Lebanese front in exchange for the Maronites in parliament voting for his presidential candidate, Elias Sarkis, along with the traditionalist leaders of both factions. Jumbla and the LNM initially supported the move, preferring the Maronites to be dependent on an Arab power rather than a Western one, or even worse, on Israel. Assad's goal in Lebanon was to re-establish the pre-crisis status quo, in which the PLO were dependent on his support and would continue to attack Israel, who would subsequently retaliate and then turn the world against it. On May 8th, Sarkis would be elected president. However, constitutionally, Frangia's term didn't expire until September 1976, and he refused to step down until then, which threatened negotiations between the Maronites and Muslims. Syria was inching towards intervention in Lebanon, but they had additional worries, namely Israel. It found itself in a no less uncomfortable position regarding Israel. Because the involvement of the Syrian army in Lebanon inevitably weakened its deployment along the ceasefire line in the Golan Heights. At the same time, it was clear that if the Syrian army occupied southern Lebanon, we would be forced to take pragmatic steps to push it back. Israel could not tolerate having Syrian troops stationed along two of her borders. Syrian troops would enter Lebanon on June 1st, with the intent of weakening the PLO and LNM, giving the Lebanese government a chance to re-establish a standing army. Behind the scenes, they negotiated with Israel, using the US as an intermediary. They agreed to a red line in Lebanon, which limited the size of Syrian forces and forbade Syria from placing surface-to-air missiles in Lebanon. It found itself in a no less uncomfortable position regarding Israel. Because the involvement of the Syrian army in Lebanon inevitably weakened its deployment along the ceasefire line in the Golan Heights. At the same time, it was clear that if the Syrian army occupied southern Lebanon, we would be forced to take pragmatic steps to push it back. Israel could not tolerate having Syrian troops stationed along two of her borders. The fighting intensified to the point where foreign officials were now at risk in Beirut. On June 16, 1976, U.S. Ambassador Francis E. Meloy Jr. was assassinated. Two days later, President Ford ordered the evacuation of U.S. citizens from Lebanon, an inverse of the Eisenhower administration's actions nearly 20 years earlier. As the Syrians invade, intense fighting breaks out around Beirut, Tripoli, Sidon, between the Latani and Awali rivers, and Mount Hermon. The Syrians overpower the LNM and PLO forces along the Damascus-Beirut highway. Christian militias attack hostile Muslim enclaves in their territories, and the Syrians disrupt the LNM-PLO supply lines. The Maronites also begin an offensive against the Palestinian camps of Tal Zatar and Jisir Basha. Much of the Arab world had opposed Syria's intervention into Lebanon. On June 23rd, the Arab League met in Riyadh to approve of an Arab peace force to replace Syrian troops. The LNM and PLO supported the Arab League intervention, while the Lebanese Ba'ath Party began to turn on Assad. The Arab world and the Soviet Union would condemn Syria for its cooperation with the US and Israel. Hafez tries to turn this narrative around in a speech on July 20th, in which he claims that the Lebanese Civil War was a plot by Zionists and imperialists to commit genocide against the Palestinians and partition Lebanon into Israeli puppet states. He declares that Lebanon is rightfully part of Syria, and therefore he was obligated to intervene to protect the Lebanese from Israeli aggression. In contrast to Assad's claims, Yasser Arafat claimed that the Palestinian resistance had nothing to do with the conflict in Lebanon. By July 22nd, the Syrians had achieved most of their initial goals by weakening the PLO enough to ensure their dependency on Damascus. The Syrians got the PLO to approve the recent constitutional reforms, which they had initially opposed, fearing it would weaken support for their cause among Lebanese Muslims. This deal also included President Frangia, who agreed to restore the Cairo Agreement, and, on paper, the pre-crisis status quo. Bashir Jamal begins to consolidate his authority over the Maronite factions after the fall of the Tal Zatar camp to Phalangis on August 12th, in which 3,000 Palestinians were killed. Elias Sarkis finally became president on September 23rd. He was widely viewed as a puppet of Hafez al-Assad, never making any serious decisions without approval from Damascus. On October 26th, an Arab League summit again called for an international Arab force to replace the Syrian troops, to which Assad finally agreed. This new body, known as the Arab Deterrence Force, 
or ADF, would have 30,000 troops, 90% of which would be made up of the Syrian forces that were already in Lebanon. Functionally, this just meant that the other 10% would be reinforcements from other Arab states. Syria also arranged a new ceasefire with the LNM, which called for the Cairo Agreement to be back in force, as well as for the new ADF to be placed in Syria by November. Once in the country, the ADF was supposed to be under the command of President Sarkis, but the Maronites did not support this ceasefire, not trusting the Arab League to be a neutral arbiter, especially because Sarkis was widely seen as Assad's puppet. As of November 1976, the LNM, PLO, LAA, and Syrians are now all allied with the Lebanese government, while the Maronites grew more apprehensive. They continued to hold their enclaves in East Beirut, as well as communities north of the capital. The Israelis continued to support Saad Haddad in southern Lebanon, who was actively fighting against the PLO for control of southern Lebanon. In January of 1977, the Maronite factions held their own conference to discuss how they should respond to the Syrian government's agreements with the Muslim, Palestinian, and leftist factions. They came to three main points. First, they refused to comply with the Cairo Agreement. Second, they called for the expulsion of the Palestinians from Lebanon and for them to be resettled in other Arab League states. And third, they refused to cooperate with the Arab Deterrence Force. As the Syrians solidified their position in Lebanon, more Christian officers in the Lebanese army began to defect and set up their own militias, taking control of pockets along the southern border with Israel. The IDF would send weapons and other aid to these militias as well, using them as a frontline defense against PLO raids, expanding on the good fence policy. On March 16th, Kamal Jamblat was assassinated. Jamblat did not support a long-term occupation of Lebanon by Syrian forces, and it is suspected that Assad had him killed. Kamal was succeeded by his son, Walid Jumblat, who became the new leader of the Progressive Socialist Party and the LNM. And in this position, he bent the knee to Assad. Despite all of the evidence that it was Assad who had Kamal killed, the Druze blamed the Christians for his death. And in retaliation, they slaughtered Christian communities within their enclaves on Mount Lebanon. After having weakened the PLO enough to no longer pose a threat to the Syrian aims, Assad resumed aiding them again in southern Lebanon, who fought against the Maronite militias along the southern border. Back in Israel, a worsening economic situation, along with numerous scandals in the Rabin government, resulted in the political right gaining a majority of seats in the Knesset for the first time in the country's history, in May 1977. This political revolution was led by Menachem Begin, a former member of the Ergun and the head of the Likud party. The policy of retaliating against PLO terror attacks with commando raids and bombing runs was common practice under the prior left-wing governments. But under Begin and Likud, the IDF would take a more active role in the fight against the PLO, and they would reach out more to the Lebanese front, led by Bashir Jamal, who were more receptive to Israeli aid after the Syrians resumed arming the PLO in the south. In July of 1977, another summit of the Arab League called for the PLO to pull further back from the border with Israel, and to let the Lebanese army and the ADF replace them along the border. The Maronites opposed this because it legitimized the PLO as a negotiating partner with the Lebanese government, all the while they were being allowed to govern Lebanese territory. The Israelis also opposed this measure because it would make retaliating against the PLO targets more difficult. The various ceasefires began to break down in late summer. Christian militias capture Qiyam and the PLO resumes firing Katusha rockets into northern Israel. The newly elected President Jimmy Carter in the US had an acute interest in the Middle East and was trying to negotiate a ceasefire between the various factions. In his memoirs, he is quite critical of the Begin government's bombing of Lebanon, although he fails to mention that this policy was a holdover from previous labor governments and were in retaliation for terrorist attacks and rocket fire into Israel. Carter's plans were a tad ambitious, believing that he could resolve all the conflicts in the region with a big peace conference. We still had two basic problems in setting up the Geneva meeting. The Arabs wanted maximum Palestinian participation, but the Israelis wanted none, and the Soviet Union was reluctant to alienate any of its Arab friends or to deal fairly with Israel. Despite the failure of his Geneva plan, he was able to mediate a temporary ceasefire on September 25th but the fighting would resume in November. The Cold War between Syria and Egypt would take a decisive turn in Syria's favor, when Anwar Sadat visited Jerusalem in the fall of 1977. Sadat was seen by many as a traitor to the pan-Arabist cause by negotiating with Israel, 
This led more Arab and Islamist groups to look to Assad for leadership. But in Beirut, the Maronites had become more hostile to Assad, holding anti-Syrian demonstrations in North Beirut. These resulted in clashes between the Maronite militias and the Syrian ADF. In January of 1978, President Assad began pressuring President Sarkis to sign a defense treaty with Syria so he could keep Syrian troops in the country after the ADF mandate ended. But in February, the Lebanese army, under the command of Antoine Barakat, an ally of former President Chamoun and the National Liberal Party, attacked ADF troops at Fayadiyya. The ADF responded by attacking the National Liberal Party headquarters and other Christian neighborhoods in East Beirut. Another ceasefire is signed to end the fighting. Syria begins pushing the PLO back into southern Lebanon by sending in as Sakai, the militant wing of the Palestinian Ba'athist Party, which was part of the PLO, and who managed to capture Maroon Ross. On March 9, 1978, 13 PLO terrorists from Fatah left by boat from coastal Lebanon with the intention of landing on a beach at Tel Aviv and taking a hotel hostage. The goal was to either get the Israelis to release a number of imprisoned PLO members, or, if that failed, to kill as many Israeli civilians as possible. The operation was planned by Khalil al-Wazir. He was a co-founder of Fatah and had planned a similar operation three years earlier at the Savoy Hotel, which resulted in the deaths of eight Israeli civilians, three IDF soldiers, and seven of the eight Fatah terrorists that had been sent in. Al-Wazir, however, was not present at either operation. During the journey, two of the PLO drowned in the Mediterranean, and a navigation error resulted in their boat landing on the wrong beach. They landed near Magan Michael, north of Tel Aviv, where they met an American photographer, Gail Rubin, and asked her where they were. After she told them, they killed her. Gail Rubin, as it turned out, was a niece of U.S. Senator Abraham Ribicoff of Connecticut, who would refer to the attack as an indefensible act of terrorism that deserves universal condemnation. The 11 terrorists made their way to a nearby highway and started opening fire at passing cars. They hijacked a white Mercedes taxi, killed its occupants, and started driving toward Tel Aviv. They found a charter bus driving down the highway, which they also hijacked, holding the riders hostage. However, at least one person was killed and their body thrown out of the bus. They then hijacked another bus and forced the passengers from the first to get on the new bus. At one point they stopped so one of the terrorists could get out and fire indiscriminately into traffic, killing at least one more person. Israeli police were eventually dispatched and had a standoff at Gilat Junction, and as the passengers tried to escape, the terrorists murdered them. A counterterrorism unit would finally arrive at the scene. Nine of the 11 remaining PLO were killed, taking the last two into custody. One of the surviving attackers told the Israelis that the intent of the attack was to derail the peace talks between Egypt and Israel. Anwar Sadat condemned the attack as an irresponsible action, all the while trying to discourage the Israelis from retaliating. President Carter called it an outrageous act of lawlessness and senseless brutality. The PLO's official statement said, the operation stems from the firm belief of Fatah and the necessity of carrying on the armed struggle against the Zionist enemy within the occupied land. Prime Minister Menachem Begin compared the attack to Nazi atrocities. They came here to kill Jews. They intended to take hostages and threatened, as the leaflet they left said, to kill all of them if we did not surrender to their demands. We shall not forget, and I can only call upon other nations, not to forget that Nazi atrocity that was perpetrated upon our people yesterday. And this was, at least at the time, the most devastating terrorist attack in the country's history. And Israel's first right-wing government wasn't going to take it lying down. Three days after the attack, the IDF retaliated with their first military intervention into Lebanon, Operation Latani. The goal was to create a 10-kilometer buffer zone along Lebanon's southern border, but it ended up going as far north as the Latani River. Over 20,000 IDF were sent in, and the invasion resulted in 1,000 deaths and 160,000 displaced persons. While in southern Lebanon, the Israelis built roads and made connections with local Christian communities, giving Lebanese Christians in the region access to work visas so they could work in Israel. President Carter pushed a UN resolution to order the withdrawal of the IDF from Lebanon. Carter feared that the Israeli intervention would undo the ongoing peace talks between Begin and Sadat the latter blaming Israel for the entire conflict in Lebanon. A ceasefire would be brokered on March 20th with UN Resolution 425, 
It called for a UN force, referred to as UNIFIL, to police southern Lebanon. But it would take time for the IDF to fully pull out. As the Israelis began to withdraw, the Syrians began to provide anti-aircraft cover for the PLO in southern Lebanon, which violated the Red Line Agreement made prior to the Syrian intervention back in 1976. Assad would also allow international volunteers to freely pass through Syria and Lebanon to join the PLO. Fighting breaks out again between the Maronites and the ADF in Beirut. President Sarkis tries to appease the Christian leaders by replacing Syrian ADF troops with Saudi and Sudanese ones. At this time, Sarkis tries to assert more independence from Syria by rejecting a defense treaty Assad had been pressuring him to sign. He also begins to take the Maronite Lebanese Front's position regarding the Palestinians, and wanting to abrogate the Cairo Agreement, but Hafez wouldn't allow this. In May of 1978, Pierre Jamal and Camille Chamoun took a secret trip to Israel, in which they arranged for arms shipments to Lebanon. Most of this was paid for by the Maronite diaspora. Back in Lebanon, Bashir Jamal puts more effort into consolidating the Christian forces under his leadership. This involves having phalangist militias attack moderate Maronite leaders, such as Ramon Ed, who survives the attack but goes into exile in France for his own safety. Another opponent of the Jamiles were the Frangias. A member of the Lebanese parliament and son of former Prime Minister Suleiman Frangia, Tony Frangia had his own militia, the Zagarta Liberation Army. But over the course of the war, he found that he was not trusting the Falangists and believing that they were going to escalate violence. And so he had the Zagarta Liberation Army target leaders of the Falangists believing that they were going to escalate violence. Well, the Falangists weren't going to take this lying down, so they eventually massacre the Frangia family at their clan estate in Eden, Tony Frangia being amongst those massacred. Former President Suleiman Frangia, once sympathetic to the Lebanese Front's goals, now has a vendetta against them, and in particular, the Falangists. He would use his own clan's militia, the Marada, to massacre the Falangists in Baalbek. That same day, the IDF finishes its withdrawal from Lebanon, but instead of handing over control of the border region to UNIFIL or to the Lebanese army, as Resolution 425 ordered, they would hand it over to Saad Haddad and the Army of Southern Lebanon, whom they trusted to protect northern Israel from the PLO more than the UN. President Sarkis continues his campaign to distinguish himself from the Syrians by implementing a program to distance the ADF from parts of the country with higher tensions, and replace them with the Lebanese army, but Assad disapproves. The Lebanese front fires on Syrian ADF units, to which Assad responds by shelling East Beirut. The attack weakens the confidence of Christians in President Sarkis, who would then threaten to resign from office unless Assad agrees to hand control of the ADF to him, and to disarm all non-government forces in Lebanon. But Assad, allied to the PLO and LNM, looked into replacing Sarkis with Suleiman Frangia, aiding his vendetta against the Jamiles and the Lebanese front. Pierre Jamal and Camille Chamoun visit Israel again in July to formalize plans to create an independent Christian government in the event that Sarkis resigns. But due to international pressure, Sarkis decides to stay on. Bashir Jamal visits Israel himself in July, making first contact with Defense Minister Ariel Sharon. Haddad's forces begin clashing with the Lebanese army near Kalakba and Marji Ayun. The Lebanese army manages to repel Haddad's militias, but they are then attacked by the PLO. Under this pressure, the unit disintegrates by mid-August. In August of 1978, the leader of the Lebanese Shia, Musa al-Sadr, visits Libya, but he goes missing. Many of his most devoted followers believe that he is still in hiding to this day, going into an occultation-like state like many of the imams from Shia Islam. Sadr's Amal militias would come under the leadership of Muhammad Mahdi Shams al-Din and Husseini el husseini who have close ties to revolutionaries in Iran. In the fall of 1978, the ADF began attacking Lebanese front positions in Batroun and Ashrafia, resulting in over 200,000 Christians displaced in East Beirut, who then fled to Maronite strongholds in the mountains. Syria tries to blockade the Lebanese coast, but the Israelis managed to breach the blockade in order to deliver food and arms to the Christian-controlled port of Junia. Another ceasefire is brokered in October. After Sarkis failed to get Syria to limit its involvement in Lebanon, the Arab League extended the ADF mandate for another six months. None of the factions in Lebanon wanted the Syrians to completely pull out, including most of the Maronites, and Assad would use this knowledge to get his way by threatening to pull out in order to get what he wanted, such as getting Sarkis to replace cabinet members. In the winter of 1979, President Sarkis became openly supportive of the Lebanese Front. In response, the pro-Syrian parliament voted to take control of the military away from the president and put it into the hands of the cabinet, 
which, as applied earlier, would be stacked with pro-Syrian puppets. Fighting breaks out around East Beirut between various Maronite factions. Muslim divisions of the Lebanese army clash with Haddad in southern Lebanon, who declares his controlled territory as the Free State of Lebanon, and starts receiving aid from the Lebanese front. By spring, most of the non-Syrian divisions within the ADF had pulled out of Lebanon, making it an essentially Syrian-controlled body. In addition, the Iranian revolution ousted the Shah, and Iranian revolutionaries began making contact with Shia forces in Lebanon. In the spring of 1979, Syria began a political campaign to isolate the Maronite factions that had any ties to Israel, refusing to work with any Maronite or Maronite group that had any. This campaign made its way into the Lebanese cabinet. The Lebanese national movement demanded that the Lebanese front be disarmed, but the Christian militias refused to disarm until the Palestinian issue was taken care of. The Lebanese front in response demanded that the Lebanese army take over the policing activities of the ADF. Bashir Jamal continued his campaign to unify the Maronites under his leadership, and to take full control of East Beirut. He did the latter by removing non-Christians from East Beirut through violence and intimidation, which won him the loyalty of other Christian groups. To achieve the former, the Phalanges clashed with the Armenian militias of the Tashnak party. In March of 1979, the Camp David Accords are signed, in which Israel agreed to withdraw from the Sinai over the course of three years, and that formal relations between Egypt and Israel be established. This shakes up the Middle East, and Egypt would be expelled from the Arab League and labeled as a traitor to the Arab and Palestinian cause. I want to tell Carter and Begin that when the Arabs set off their volcano, there will be only Arabs in this part of the world. Our people will continue to fuel the torch of the revolution with rivers of blood until the whole of the occupied homeland is liberated, not just part of it. Back in Israel under Ariel Sharon, the IDF changes its tactics in dealing with the PLO in Lebanon. Instead of retaliating against individual PLO attacks in Israel, they would begin a continuous air campaign against the PLO. The logic was that the PLO couldn't plan or orchestrate any attacks on Israel so long as they were under fire in Lebanon. And it did work in curtailing the number of attacks the PLO committed in Israel, but it also resulted in more human and collateral damage, which turned more of the world against Israel. It also threatened to break the recently signed treaty with Egypt, which made the Carter administration extra worried and angry with Sharon and Begin. In response to this change in policy, the LNM wanted Lebanon to adopt an explicitly anti-Israel foreign policy, advocating for increased hostility towards Israel and any country or group that allied or affiliated with it. Syria responds by sending its air force to patrol the skies of South Lebanon beyond the red lines set by the 1976 agreement to discourage Israel air raids against the PLO. The November summit of the Arab League called for the arming of Palestinians against the Israelis in Lebanon, as well as sending monetary aid to the Lebanese government. Arafat plays his role in continuing the PLO strategy of internationally isolating Israel. The other face of the battle is the mounting war of attrition against the Lebanese and Palestinian peoples. The most modern weapons, even the internationally banned ones, are being used in this war. This is resulting in the destruction of many Lebanese towns and villages and Palestinian camps and in the eviction of hundreds of thousands of Lebanese and Palestinian people. Actually, this terrorist and hellish plan is still continuing and the Zionist enemy leaders continue to implement it. This, however, will neither intimidate us nor make us hesitate to reply to the enemy actions both in the occupied land and in southern Lebanon and with all forms of the military and political struggle. The Lebanese army would attempt to deploy to southern Lebanon in order to take care of the PLO problem itself before the Israelis could attack, but Assad and the ADF blocked them. In the winter of 1980, Syria began moving its forces away from the coast and further south to discourage potential Israeli air raids. Assad also wants to weaken the Maronites by fostering infighting between their various factions. He gets his wish when violence breaks out between the Phalanges and Maratha, but fighting would also break out between Amal and the PLO in southern Lebanon. More Maronite infighting breaks out in the spring between the National Liberal Party and the Phalangists. The fighting broke out over Kamil Chamoun being accused of having contacts with the PLO, to which he and the NLP accused the Phalangists of working with the Syrians. In early July, Bashir Jamal orders the Phalangists to attack the NLP in East Beirut, which ends with the NLP militia leader, Danny Chamoun, going into exile in Paris. 
Afterwards, Camille Chamoun and Pierre Jamile announced the merger of their two parties. The NLP militias were supposed to hand over their positions in Beirut to the Phalangists, but out of spite, they handed them over to the Lebanese army instead. The Phalangists would finish off the remnants of the NLP in October. The region would turn against Assad in the summer of 1980, when the Iran-Iraq War broke out. In this conflict, Assad had sided with Shia Iran instead of Sunni Arab Iraq. The Phalangists and the Lebanese Front decided to reorganize themselves and their activities. The Phalangists would take over all militant activities, while the Lebanese Front would take over all political actions. They began to conscript all party members aged 16 to 45 into the militia, and organize themselves to supplant the Lebanese government and the areas they controlled. The Lebanese Front would publish a manifesto calling for Lebanon to be transformed into a confederation and for the removal of all foreign interference, especially Syria and the Palestinians. By this point, the Maronites either wanted a guaranteed place in the Lebanese government or their own independent state. And as Jamal tightened his control over the Christians of Lebanon, his ties with Israel tightened as well. He eliminates all Christian opposition groups in Zal and then attacks the nearby Syrian ADF, the Syrians retaliate by besieging the city and shelling it. A ceasefire is called, allowing Bashir's forces to pull out of the city and fortify their positions outside of it. During the winter of 1981, the Lebanese forces began linking up with other Maronite enclaves that had been out of reach up to that point, some of which were connected with the Israeli good fence policy. In particular, Bashir Jamal wanted the Lebanese forces to connect up with Saad Haddad and the South Lebanon army, who already had ties to the IDF. This would give the Phalangists access to a steadier supply of arms and munitions from Israel. The Syrians feared this happening, and armed the PLO and its other proxies in the region to hold out against the Maronite attacks. And at this time, a third U.S. president would try their hands at making peace in Lebanon. As every president since World War II has learned, no region of the world presents America with more difficult, more frustrating, or more convoluted problems than the Middle East. It's a region where hate has roots reaching back to the dawn of history. It's a place where the senseless spilling of blood in the name of religious faith has gone on since biblical times and where modern events are forever being shaped by momentous events of the past from the exodus to the Holocaust. An ardent Cold Warrior, President Reagan wanted to use this conflict to try and displace the Soviets as the region's primary arms dealer. We wanted, at the outset of the administration, to make some substantial gesture to the moderate Arabs as an earnest of American friendship and resolve. The sale of aircraft to Saudi Arabia provided that opportunity. We believed that Israel's security would be enhanced rather than threatened by our policy and that the peace process would be advanced by it. But he faced opposition due to the Arab state's hostilities toward Israel. Reagan wanted to expand the Camp David process begun under Carter to bring the Gulf states to recognize Israel. After the assassination of Sadat, there were fears that Hosni Mubarak might renege on Camp David. This process was made more difficult when the Begin government destroyed an Iraqi nuclear reactor, as well as when they annexed the Golan Heights into Israel proper. In private, Reagan was actually supportive of Israel destroying the Osirak reactor, but due to the U.S. supporting Iraq in its war against Iran, he was forced to publicly condemn Israel's attack. The annexation of the Golans, however, was viewed by the administration as having little benefit to the overall peace process. In their meetings and communications, the IDF had promised Bashir Jamal that if the Syrians attacked his position with warplanes, Israel would militarily intervene. The Lebanese Front wanted to gain control of Zal so it could continue constructing its own road network connecting the Christian enclaves in the south to the Maronite positions in East Beirut. Outgunned, Bashir looked for a way to drag the Israelis into the fight so he could dislodge the Syrians. The Lebanese forces attempted another attack against the ADF around Zal in April of 1981, but they were outmatched by the Syrians' superior firepower, who retaliated by shelling the city and attacking the Maronite positions dug in around Zal with the help of the LNM and PLO. In retaliation, Prime Minister Begin stepped up Israeli airstrikes against the PLO south of the Red Line and threatened Assad that if the Syrians tried to massacre the Lebanese Christians, Israel would intervene directly against them. The Reagan administration went into overtime trying to ease the tensions, but negotiations broke down after the Syrians began attacking Maronite positions west of Zal. In retaliation, the Israelis shot down two Syrian helicopters, the first direct engagement between the two since the Yom Kippur War. Syria responds by violating the last remaining provision of the 76 Red Line Agreement, 
by sending in surface-to-air missiles into southern Lebanon in order to deter Israeli airstrikes against the PLO, who were also backed by the LNM and Amal. Ariel Sharon and Begin planned an attack to destroy the SAMs, but on the day of the attack, bad weather forced them to postpone, which allowed tensions to cool down. Despite tensions cooling between the Israelis and Syrians, the PLO resumed its own rocket attacks against Israeli civilians under the protection of the Soviet SAMs. In addition to this, the PLO had constructed a series of tunnels across southern Lebanon that allowed them to hide their men as well as weapons depots from Israeli bombing raids. U.S. Ambassador Philip Habib, making emergency runs between Beirut, Damascus, and Jerusalem, presented a ceasefire agreement that Prime Minister Begin could support, but his defense minister, Ariel Sharon, was not on board. In the cabinet debates that followed, I strenuously opposed the ceasefire, stressing that if we accepted it, we would soon find ourselves in a very difficult situation. No doubt, the PLO would reduce its activity along the Lebanese border in accord with the letters of the agreement. But at the same time, I was sure that it would step up their activities elsewhere, sending squads into Israel through Jordan and intensifying terrorism from their cells on the West Bank and in Gaza. They would also be free to undertake actions all over the world, these two orchestrated from their headquarters in Beirut. Meanwhile, our hands would be tied by the ceasefire. Some of these criticisms would amend the ceasefire agreement to cover the PLO attacks in all of Israel, not just the Galilee. But this left Jews and Israeli citizens abroad as fair game for assassination, which is exactly what happened. The PLO began building up their weapons caches in southern Lebanon, including rockets. They also failed to keep their word on not committing acts of terrorism within Israel itself. Sharon wanted to retaliate against the PLO, but Begin, under international pressure, decided not to for the time being. But by summer of 1981, they resumed their attacks against the PLO. At this time, Bashir Jamal was engaging in secret discussions with President Sarkis in Beirut. Bashir offered to cut all ties with Israel if it would make serious progress in national reunification. This happened shortly before he made a visit to Washington, D.C. With the Lebanese presidential election coming up in 1982, Bashir was interested in running for the office. But being seen as a puppet of Israel would have harmed his chances of winning. So he began testing the waters. Despite his offers to President Sarkis, the deal was rejected by Assad. But in the September meeting of the Arab League, Syria demanded that the Lebanese front cut ties with Israel, which its leader had just offered privately. Assad would have a history of doing this. In public, he demands that he wants someone to do X. Then that person offers to do X in private, to which he says, that's not enough anymore. Only then to in public say all he wants is X. At another Arab League summit in November, Yasser Arafat promised Elias Sarkis that he would end PLO attacks on Israel from southern Lebanon. At this same meeting, Assad tries to keep the attention focused on southern Lebanon so he can keep their attention on what Israel is doing to the Palestinians and not what Syria has been doing to the Christians in the rest of Lebanon. The winter of 1982 saw Assad's war against Bashir Jamal's campaign for president go public. At this time, Assad was having problems with the Syrian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, so he accused Bashir of working with them, which was patently untrue. He also accused him of keeping up secret ties with the Israelis, which was true. He had recently met with Israeli Defense Minister Ariel Sharon. It is believed that Bashir offered Israel a peace treaty between Lebanon and Israel if he became president, but he would need their military aid to win. Since the ceasefire back in 1981, the PLO had continued terror attacks against Israeli targets abroad, as well as within Israel itself, with the IDF occasionally retaliating. U.S. Secretary of State Alexander Haig had received word from Begin that Israel was considering another military intervention into southern Lebanon, calling it a matter of conscience. At that same time, the U.S. had tried to get the Syrians to remove the SAMs from the Bekaa Valley, but Assad refused to budge. In March 1982, Israeli officers in Paris and Athens were attacked by the PLO, as well as IDF soldiers in Jenin and Gaza being killed. On April 3rd, an Israeli embassy official was killed in Paris. A pair of Israeli soldiers were inspecting the buffer zone in southern Lebanon when their vehicle was blown up, killing the soldiers. And on May 7th, Israeli planes hit PLO targets in southern Lebanon, to which the PLO responded by firing rockets into northern Israel. The PLO was divided, and Yasser Arafat did not have nearly as much authority over them as he led on. On May 16th, leaders of the PLO factions not aligned with Arafat declared the ceasefire to be null and void. They continued terrorist attacks against Israel and Israelis in order to trigger a regional war against the Jewish state. On June 4th, the Israeli ambassador to the UK, Shlomo Argov, was shot. He survived the attack, 
but was left with permanent injuries. One of the assailants was killed by a Scotland Yard security officer, and in the assassin's pockets they found a list of other Jewish and Israeli targets in the UK and Europe. Begin's cabinet met that same day to formulate a response. It is inconceivable that these malevolent criminals should be allowed to strike our ambassadors. We cannot wait for our ambassadors in Athens or Rome to be murdered tomorrow, and it is easier for the terrorists to operate there than in London. Again, the Reagan administration was trying to talk Israel down from military intervention. We tried very hard to persuade Begin and Sharon that these radical Palestinian elements were trying to goad, manipulate, and provoke them into war. They listened, but they did not hear. As far as they were concerned, any act of terrorism by any Palestinian anywhere in the world was a violation of the ceasefire in Lebanon, and they claimed the right to take whatever steps they thought necessary to defend the people of Israel. The Ergov shooting was merely the match that ignited the fuse. The real casus belli was the chain of terrorist attacks and the continuing buildup of long-range artillery in southern Lebanon, all of which had taken place during the 11-month-long supposed ceasefire. The Israelis responded with airstrikes hitting PLO bases in the suburbs of Beirut and in southern Lebanon, to which the PLO responded by indiscriminately firing rockets into northern Israel. This was the final straw for Begin. Israel would invade Lebanon again. But this time, instead of a quick in-and-out operation, it would drag on for nearly two decades, and it would occupy a similar space in the Israeli mind that Vietnam does in America. Begin wanted to avoid the military taking actions on its own like they had in previous wars, so he ordered that no advance past the minimum goalpost of 25 miles be made without an explicit order from the cabinet. They were also adamant on avoiding conflict with the Syrians, whose Soviet-provided Frog and Scud missiles could hit most of Israel. They would send a steady stream of messages to the Syrians, telling them that they only wanted to take out the terrorists behind their lines. Sharon also ordered the army to avoid harming civilians, in order to avoid the mistakes made during the Latani operation back in 1978. Ariel Sharon wanted to weaken the grip of the PLO over the West Bank, and believed expelling them from Lebanon, and Beirut in particular, would do this. He also wanted Syria out of Lebanon, so it couldn't protect the PLO, nor interfere in Lebanon's political process. Sharon also wanted an Israeli-friendly government in Lebanon, and believed this could not be achieved so long as the PLO and Syria were in the country. The Soviets blamed the U.S. for Israel's invasion of Lebanon, accusing it of okaying the operation. The U.S. had suspected that Israel might invade Lebanon, but they had no idea a time, manner, or what would trigger it. Reagan replied that the Soviets were just as responsible for the conflict in the Middle East by not supporting the Camp David Accords and by encouraging Syrian actions in the region. As the Israelis advanced in the Bekaa Valley, the Syrians responded with artillery fire and moving their forces to block the Israeli path toward terrorist targets. As the Syrians advanced, the PLO began firing into northern Israel. The cabinet approved an alteration to the 25-mile limit in order to allow the IDF to fake a flanking maneuver against the Syrians in hopes that they would pull back out of fear of being cut off from reinforcements. IDF soldiers ran into trouble when engaging the PLO, such as civilians being taken hostage or used as human shields. The order to avoid civilian casualties resulted in the IDF taking more casualties itself, which slowed down the Israeli timetable for completing the operation. While listening to my father's war stories growing up, I often wondered how I would conduct myself under fire. Now I knew. My Zionist bravado shrank before the reality of whizzing scraps of white hot metal. Much time in warfare would pass before I grew indifferent to the hiss of projectiles overhead or the sight of scattered body parts. Hafez had ordered his armies in Lebanon to fire on the IDF if they advanced up the central route in Lebanon. The Israelis tried to send a message to Hafez through U.S. Ambassador Philip Habib, asking them to remove the terrorist artillery and rocket launchers. As this message was being delivered, the Syrians were mobilizing their reserves and sending in more anti-aircraft weaponry as well as firing on Israeli forces from their own jets. On June 9th, the Israelis attacked the Syrian SAMs, destroying all of them. The Soviets had been backing the Syrians, but after the attack, they asked the United States to broker a ceasefire. Reagan sent a message demanding a ceasefire go into effect at 6 a.m. June 10th, but the Syrians had made no moves towards a ceasefire themselves. At that same time, the cabinet received a message from Assad, saying that he couldn't stop the PLO from continuing to fire rockets. The Israelis needed the Syrians to withdraw before the ceasefire went into effect, so they could take out the PLO. 
They also wanted to have control of the Damascus-Beirut highway, which would prevent the Syrians from installing another puppet government in Lebanon's 1982 elections. It would also allow the Israelis to link up with their Maronite allies, thus surrounding Beirut, which would allow the Christians to take the capital. On June 10th, the Syrians began retreating from the Beka Valley. The IDF received orders to complete their new operations, that being to prevent the Syrians from re-establishing their old positions. And at noon on June 11th, a unilateral ceasefire from Israel would commence. The IDF had failed to capture the Beirut-Damascus highway by the time of the ceasefire, but after the ceasefire had gone into effect, the PLO near Beirut began firing on the IDF, to which they responded. Sharon met with Bashir Jamal and discerned that he and the Lebanese front had no intention of continuing or aiding in the fight against the PLO. The Syrian forces in the city were cut off from the Syrian forces in the northern part of the highway, and the terrorists in Beirut were cut off from reinforcements. PLO members began joining the Syrian positions, and foreign volunteers from Syria, Libya, Iraq, and Iran began arriving in Beirut to join up with the PLO. We were walking a tightrope. Some 6,000 armed PLO are holed up in Beirut. President Sarkis of Lebanon can't say openly, but he apparently wants Israel to stay near until the PLO can be disarmed. Then he wants to restore the central government of Lebanon, allow Palestinians to become citizens, and get all foreign forces to withdraw from Lebanon. The world is waiting for us to use our muscle and order Israel out. We can't do this if we want to help Sarkis, and we can't explain the situation either. Some days are worse than others. In the negotiations, the Americans were asking the Israelis to leave Lebanon, but allow the Syrians to stay. They also proposed the PLO be allowed to stay, but be disarmed and made exclusively political rather than militant. The Israelis, however, were demanding the expulsion of the PLO from Lebanon, not a disarmament, and it should not just be the leadership. At this time, the Reagan administration was in the early phases of drafting its own solution to the Arab-Israeli conflict, but it had not informed the Israelis of this yet. They wanted to use Lebanon to bring the PLO to the negotiating table. The Americans were also trying to bring the Syrians closer into their orbit and away from the Soviets. Israel's goals were more limited. Secure northern Israel from terrorist attacks from Lebanon, and turn Lebanon into another regional partner like Egypt. Behind the scenes, Reagan and Begin were very angry at each other. President Reagan was telling Israel that they needed to withdraw from Lebanon while allowing the Syrians to stay while Begin was complaining that the Reagan administration was selling weapons to all the neighboring Arab states, whom at that point did not recognize Israel and it looked like they never were going to. And the Israelis had refused to okay any negotiations with the PLO until they recognized Israel's right to exist. But after that meeting, Begin's cabinet began secretly asking the Reagan administration to open up negotiations with the PLO. Had the enemy also stopped shooting then, everything would have been quiet. From that point, the entire struggle would have been political. The IDF would not have moved towards Beirut, and there wouldn't have been any more battles with the Syrians. It was the terrorists that said that they would continue to fight, and they had continued. Israel had West Beirut surrounded, but they didn't want to engage in more house-to-house -house fighting. They asked Bashir and the Lebanese Christians to go in themselves, but as the fighting had continued, he was trying to publicly distance himself from the Israelis. Thus, the IDF begins a siege of the city, sporadically cutting off access to food, water, and electricity, with an occasional shelling in response to PLO attacks. As the siege continued, the U.S. was busy in negotiations with Sarkis, Arafat, Assad, and Begin to negotiate an end to the fighting. One thing was certain, the Israelis refused to leave Lebanon until the PLO was expelled. The Lebanese government wanted a multinational force rather than a UN force to oversee an evacuation of the PLO. The US National Security Council was initially opposed to US involvement in such an effort, but it had changed its mind by July 3rd. Some CIA officials had been communicating with Arafat through back channels. The PLO were saying that they were willing to negotiate and to accept the US terms, but only if the U.S. supported an independent Palestinian state, which the U.S. was not willing to do at that time. The PLO was busy lobbying representatives in Washington, while some officials wanted Israel to militarily break the back of the PLO in order to make them more pliable during negotiations. As such negotiations continued, the U.S. wanted the Palestinians to accept U.N. Resolution 242, which called for Israel to return occupied territories in exchange for peace, and that Israel had the right to exist, which had been rejected by the PLO and most Palestinian groups since before the Six-Day War. 
But as fighting continued and pressure mounted, on July 17th, Secretary George P. Schultz gave Arafat 24 hours to respond. A message from Arafat is delivered via President Sarkis, in which he says the PLO wants to leave Lebanon, but refuses to leave until they get guarantees of the protection for the Palestinian refugees in the camps, that an Arab force or the Lebanese army be involved in their evacuation, and that countries should be already set up for them to resettle in. Behind the scenes, the U.S. was negotiating with all of the Arab states. Saudi Arabia told the Americans that they got Syria to agree to take them in, but the PLO refused, wanting to maintain autonomy apart from Assad. On July 20th, Schultz met with Prince Saud of Saudi Arabia and Foreign Minister Abdel Qaddam of Syria to address the multinational force and Lebanon. They told Schultz that none of the members of the Arab League were willing to take in the PLO. They both feared that if they took in the few thousand PLO fighters that were thought to be in Beirut alone, they would either be forced to take in the other 400,000 Palestinians living in Lebanon, or that the families of those evacuated would be massacred, or that after the PLO was withdrawn, that Israel would not withdraw from Lebanon itself, making them look weak in their own countries. And while these negotiations were going on, the fighting continued. The Israelis wanted to drive the terrorists hiding in Beirut out of the city, so on August 1st, the IDF took control of the Beirut International Airport, as well as some of the Palestinian suburbs around East Beirut. Israeli tanks began moving to establish a line north of the city, while PLO fire on them on August 2nd. Water and power, which had been shut off and turned back on intermittently, were shut off again. Begin says he ordered the utilities to be turned back on. Begin was demanding that the U.S. not negotiate directly with the PLO, but that they could use intermediaries, but they have to be at least 300 yards apart. Throughout the negotiations, both the PLO and the Israelis were making petty demands, which showed that they both cared more about the optics of their home audiences rather than the reality on the ground. Back in Washington, Israel's foreign minister, Yitzhak Shamir, meets with President Reagan and Secretary of State George P. Schultz and engages in a tough discussion with the Americans. Soviets are profiting from the nature of your retaliation. Fifteen hours of shelling make people forget who fired the first shot. The Soviets may even be stimulating it, and you are playing into their hands. After getting dressed down by the president, Shamir and Schultz talk in private on August 2nd. Shamir states that Israel doesn't trust the PLO statement that they are going to leave Beirut or Lebanon. We have doubts the PLO is ready to leave. Leaving will change their position entirely. Nowhere else can they so effectively threaten Israel as in Lebanon, not in Syria or in Egypt. We can test their readiness, make a timetable, but we don't see the connection between a ceasefire and negotiations for their departure. If the PLO knows that the U.S. links a ceasefire and negotiations, then the PLO will keep violating the ceasefire in order to block the negotiations. A peace proposal is made by the Americans on August 8th, to which the Israelis agree, but the PLO doesn't respond until August 19th. Throughout the negotiations, the Israelis continued airstrikes against PLO positions in response to the anti-Arafat factions of the PLO violating the ceasefires. The situation on the ground made negotiations with the PLO difficult. Every time a PLO faction fired on the Israelis, the IDF retaliated with artillery. This made travel between the various spots where Arafat and the PLO leaders were held up difficult, thus prolonging the negotiations. That was the crux of the problem. Habib required a ceasefire for negotiations to take place. Without a ceasefire, it would be physically impossible for negotiations to move back and forth to pass the necessary messages. If the Israelis regarded continued military pressure on the PLO as essential to convince them to leave. When you read the sources, you'll find both sides accusing the other of intentionally prolonging the negotiation process. And out of the two, I find the accusations against the PLO to be more believable. The IDF was pretty well disciplined in only attacking the PLO when they were fired upon. In contrast, there was much less discipline amongst the PLO, considering there were factions fighting alongside Arafat, but not taking orders from him. The factions not following Arafat were probably intentionally dragging out the fight, hoping to turn the international community against Israel, thinking that they could outlast them. I find this to be the most believable, considering it is consistent with two decades of PLO strategy up to this point. The eventual agreement was for the PLO fighters to be disarmed and removed from the country with a multinational force escorting them out. The difficulty, however, would be finding countries that actually wanted to take them in. The Israelis weren't the only ones who distrusted Arafat and the PLO. Most of the Arab world did as well. They were happy to set them loose on the Israelis, but nobody wanted them in their own backyard. 
Clearly, Arab governments did not trust the PLO, and for their pro-Palestinian rhetoric, worried more about a potential PLO threat to them than about the fate of the besieged PLO. This presented us with a diplomatic problem. Just as we begin to make progress in the negotiations to get the PLO to leave Beirut, the nations were firmly backpedaling away from accepting them. At the negotiations, Begin was showing signs of annoyance with Sharon, but he was still fearful that the PLO would refuse to leave at the last minute. Tunisia said it was willing to take in all of the PLO if the U.S. had wanted it to. Considering Tunisia's population was more politically moderate than the Gulf states or Syria, this seemed like a less dangerous option. As for the PLO, I thought they were actually serious about departing when I heard their request that they be allowed to take their Mercedes-Benz with them. They presumed, they said, that the boats used in the evacuation would be car ferries. As the day for the PLO's withdrawal from Beirut neared, there were still other issues on the table. The Israelis didn't want to withdraw from Lebanon unless the Syrians did as well, which was the position of both the U.S. and the Lebanese government. President Sarkis was asking that the 1979 Cairo Declaration legitimizing Syria's intervention be revoked. Assad refused to accept these terms, but he did agree to withdraw the Palestinian troops sent into the country and to pull his troops back from their current positions. The first of the multinational forces arrived on August 21st, made up of American, British, French, and Italian troops. And on August 22nd, the evacuation of the PLO began. In addition, Syria began to withdraw PLA troops by truck back into Syria. But the families of the PLO stayed behind in Lebanon. About 8,500 PLO militants were evacuated from Beirut, which was greater than even the Israeli estimates. 2,500 members of the Palestinian Liberation Army were also pulled back into Syria. Documents found in the PLO headquarters in Beirut would reveal that their strategy was betting on popular discontent in Israel, forcing the IDF to pull out. There were even back-channel negotiations between the Labour Party and the Egyptians, the former of which were promising a better deal for the Palestinians and Egyptians should Labour return to power. Egyptian ambassadors to Lebanon would then deliver this information to Arafat and the PLO leadership. Bashir Jamal would be elected president of Lebanon on August 23rd, but the process was seen as fraudulent by many. Members of parliament were missing, and many had been bribed or threatened into supporting Bashir. As president, he called for the withdrawal of all foreign forces from Lebanon, including both the Israelis and the Syrians. The Israelis wanted to begin talks for a peace treaty between Lebanon and Israel so they could normalize relations, but Bashir refused to have these discussions. On September 14th, the Israeli ambassador to the U.S., Moshe Arendz, visited U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz, urging the Americans to push for a peace treaty between Israel and Lebanon now, saying that it was now or never. The United States unequivocally favors an Israel-Lebanon peace treaty, but a peace treaty has to be signed between sovereign governments, and Bashir Jamal's presidency is not yet sufficiently established to stand the test of legitimacy such a treaty would require. Bashir Jamal called on all foreign forces, the Palestinians, the Syrians, and the Israelis, to be expelled from Lebanon. This greatly angered the Syrian president, Hafez al-Assad. Despite Syrian forces having been pulled out of Beirut, Assad wasn't completely without assets. He still had the Syrian Social National Party, a pro-Syrian political group. After Bashir's election, the party reached out to a young recruit, Habib Shartouni a Maronite Christian whose family lived in the same apartment building that housed the Phalangist headquarters. On the night of September 13th, Shartouni broke into the room above the Phalangist headquarters and planted about 50 kilograms of high explosives and set up a wireless detonator. On the afternoon of the 14th, he waited until Bashir had arrived at the headquarters before leaving the building. Ten minutes later, the bomb detonated. There was chaos in the immediate aftermath with conflicting reports about the status and whereabouts of Bashir. The Israelis feared the situation in Beirut devolving into chaos. Defense Minister Ariel Sharon and the Chief of the General Staff, Rafael Etan, began planning an IDF incursion into West Beirut, as well as getting the Phalanges to sweep the Palestinian camp south of the city. When word of Bashir's death reached Israel, Begin met with Sharon and Etan and signed on to the IDF moving into West Beirut, but at this point, nobody mentioned having the Phalanges enter the refugee camps to Begin. The U.S. feared a war of succession erupting in Lebanon, with Secretary Schultz calling all of the involved parties to ensure a peaceful and constitutional succession of the presidency. In calls to Prime Minister Begin, Schultz urged him not to send the IDF into West Beirut, but the plans for this were already in motion. In the early morning hours of September 15th, the IDF began moving into West Beirut to secure strategic positions. 
As they entered the city, they were being fired upon from sources inside the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps. It became clear to the Israelis that not all the PLO had been evacuated, but that same morning, orders were given to the IDF forbidding entrance into the camps. The IDF wasn't allowed to enter the camps for numerous reasons. Firstly, being that a bunch of the IDF was already busy occupying West Beirut, so there was less forces to spare. But more importantly than that, though, is that the international community probably, well, just plain didn't trust the Israelis to enter the camps, regardless of whatever their conduct was. But the most important reason for it was to reduce casualties. Many in the IDF thought that it was about time that the Phalangists pulled their own weight. And so Ariel Sharon and Raphael Eitan met with the Phalangist leaders and gave them their plan for them to sweep the camps and find any of the PLO left behind that had avoided the evacuation order. Up to this point, the Phalangists had done minimal work with the IDF since the evasions began back in June. They were mostly used as guides and to help identify known PLO members amongst the Palestinian communities in southern Lebanon. They had not participated in the house-to-house -house fighting the IDF had done in the lead-up to the Siege of Beirut. This left many within the IDF, as well as within Israel, angry at the Phalangists. They were seen as the primary beneficiaries of the IDF sacrifices, but were not contributing to the effort. The Phalangists had a history of committing atrocities themselves, as well as having atrocities committed against them, but thus far, during the Israeli invasion, they had been well behaved. During these actions, there were generally no acts of vengeance or violence against the Palestinian civilian population by the Phalangists, who were operating with the IDF. Mossad agents believed that the Phalangist organization had politically and organizationally matured, and that atrocities and massacres were behind them. But there was other evidence that suggested the attitudes of the Phalangists toward the Palestinians had not changed. Sharon asked the Phalangists to enter the camps, but they said they would need at least 24 hours to mobilize. In that time, some IDF members, fearful of what the Phalangists might do, tried to preempt disaster. Major General Amir Drori reached out to the Lebanese army, asking them to enter the camps before the Phalangists could, preventing them from being left alone with the mostly defenseless Palestinians. But both the army and the Lebanese prime minister refused. The Phalangists would enter the Shatila camp at 6 p.m. on September 16th. They left a handful of officers behind at the Israeli command post, who would be in radio contact with their men entering the camp. Now, calling these areas camps might create an image of row upon row of tents. In reality, the camps were tightly packed buildings with narrow streets and alleyways. Because of this, the officers stationed at the command post outside the camps couldn't see what was going on inside them. They were completely reliant on the messages coming in over the radio. Back in Jerusalem, Begin's cabinet had met at 6 p.m., and only at that point had Sharon told the prime minister about the plan to send the phalangists into the camp. Far too often, the government had no alternative other than to endorse measures already taken. Without explicit approval or adequate information, the time lag between military action and cabinet decision being inexcusable. As the phalangists entered, the PLO who were left behind began firing at the Maronites, standing on top of the command post. They requested the IDF provide a source of light for the phalangists since the sun had been going down. The IDF provided light in the form of flares, initially deployed from an aircraft, but then switched to artillery flares, which periodically fired to keep light over the camps. IDF officers began to overhear messages being received and given out by the phalangist leaders. An IDF lieutenant overheard the liaison officer on the radio with the phalangists in the camp saying they had 50 women and children held down and they asked what they should do with them. The liaison is reported to have said, this is the last time you're going to ask me a question like that. You know exactly what to do. Another report came in where one of his men said he was holding down 45 people. The liaison officer is reported to have said, do the will of God. A phalangist officer entered the Israeli dining hall with the commanders at the post and said that they had killed about 300 people, including civilians. He left the hall and returned later and amended his casualty count down to 120. By the morning of September 17th, reports of what was going on in the Sabra and Shatila camps began to reach Jerusalem. Major General Drury tried to confirm information about the alleged casualties from commanders on the ground, but they didn't report about civilian deaths. Again, Drury tried to convince the Lebanese army to enter the camps, but again, they refused. Despite receiving reports about what was happening, Drory later reported rumors claiming that the Americans were telling the Lebanese not to negotiate with the Israelis and to refuse their requests. More reports came in. IDF soldiers overheard acts of violence coming from the camps, 
One soldier reported seeing Phalanges leading men, women, and children out of the camps and relocating them to a nearby stadium. One IDF soldier asked a Phalanges why they were killing civilians, to which he received the response, the pregnant women will give birth to terrorists, and children will grow up to be terrorists. The situation back in Israel was confused. Without Israeli officers on the ground, it was hard to confirm any of the reports coming out. Were the Phalanges literally killing women and children, or was this just dark, macabre humor from a group of soldiers hardened by years of war? Until this could be figured out, Major General Drury ordered the Phalanges operations to be halted. What this actually meant is that the Phalanges had to stay where they were and not go any deeper into the camps. But it was too little, too late. The slaughter wasn't finished until the morning of September 18th. The exact death toll is still disputed. The low estimate is approximately 300, while the high estimate is about 3,500. Unfortunately, due to a lack of sufficient documentation among Palestinians living in Lebanon, we don't and can likely never have an accurate number. After the massacre, Phalange's commanders denied their involvement. On September 19, 1982, Eitan and Drury met with Phalange's commanders and demanded they tell them about their involvement in the massacres. The commanders claimed to have no knowledge of what their men were doing and no control over their actions. It wasn't long before investigations into the massacres were ordered. Prime Minister Begin called for one himself, led by Yitzhak Kahan, the president of the Israeli Supreme Court. This report would go on to lay direct responsibility for the massacre on the Phalangists. Our conclusion is therefore that the direct responsibility for the perpetration of the acts of slaughter rests on the Phalangist forces. It is evident that the forces who entered the area were steeped in hatred for the Palestinians, and these feelings of hatred were compounded by a longing for revenge in the wake of the assassination. However, the Kahan Commission does not leave the Israelis blameless. There was a danger of a massacre, and no steps were taken which might have prevented this danger or at least greatly reduce the possibility that deeds of this type might be done, then those who made the decisions and those who implemented them are indirectly responsible for what ultimately occurred, even if they did not intend this to happen and merely disregarded the anticipated danger. Some criticize the Kahan report because it alleviates some of the responsibility for the massacres away from Israel and prefer to look at the report published by the UN's McBride Commission, led by Irish politician Sean McBride. In its analysis of the event, the McBride Commission doesn't differentiate between degrees of responsibility between those who actually did the murdering and those whose inaction made it possible. Personally, I think the Cajon Commission's approach is better because I think we all know inherently that not everybody involved is equally responsible in an atrocity. The guy cleaning the bathrooms at the Reichstag or Hitler's personal chef or tailor doesn't hold equal responsibility for the Holocaust despite being on the Nazi payroll. Just like the Palestinian civilians in the camps don't hold equal responsibility for what Arafat and the PLO did in their name. There's also the many problematic aspects of Sean McBride's personal history. He was a longtime member of the Irish Republican Army, whom, during his time in the organization and after, were known for a liberal usage of anti-Semitic rhetoric. His parents and siblings were known supporters of Nazi policy, and allegations of Sean McBride himself being a Nazi sympathizer or collaborator have dogged him for decades. What makes this more problematic was this period of time at the UN. The 1970s and 80s was a very anti-Semitic period for the United Nations. In 1975, UN Resolution 3379 redefined Zionism as a form of racial discrimination and associated it with fascism, imperialism, and apartheid, which no self-described Zionist has ever advocated. Now, I think this story deserves its own video, but I think this gives just enough historical context to understand why the McBride Report is, at the very best, not better than the Kahan Report. Whichever report you put more weight into seems to be dependent on whether or not you think the massacre was intentional. And based on everything I've read, I can clearly see that it wasn't. It was a cavalcade of incompetence, short-sightedness, and screw-ups. There's also the issue of why didn't the Lebanese army enter the camps when the Israelis asked them to on multiple occasions, but not even the Kahan Commission report decides on that. After all the bloodshed, there were demands from the Lebanese government as well as the international community for the U.S. to return to Lebanon. Reagan and Schultz wanted to send the multinational force back into Beirut, but the Secretary of Defense, Caspar Weinberger, didn't. 
Weinberger said he didn't want to send the multinational force back in until all foreign actors, Israel, Syria, Iran, and the Palestinians had left. Secretary Schultz saw these preconditions as a means to ensure that the multinational force could never be redeployed. The military wants to do what the diplomats don't think is necessary, and the diplomats want the military to do what the military is too nervous to do. Our military is nervous that Ronald Reagan isn't. The president felt that the United States must contribute to a visible, definite, constructive international effort to help the central government of Lebanon begin to regain control over its own country. The United States saw a Lebanon free of foreign forces and with control over its own territory. Such a legitimate government, we hoped, could negotiate a meaningful agreement with Israel. Weinberger felt that a limited mission was too risky and feared getting drawn into a long, protracted conflict, what we today call Vietnam Syndrome. Some wanted to leave the MNF in longer and assign it other missions, but it had been sized and equipped for the single mission it had accomplished. Moreover, I felt, as President Eisenhower had felt 25 years earlier, that we should not have a permanent presence in Lebanon. On September 20th, President Reagan announced the return of U.S. Marines to Beirut, and the Israeli cabinet approved the withdrawal of the IDF from the capital. We must pave the way for withdrawal of foreign forces. The place to begin this task is in Beirut. The Lebanese government must be permitted to restore internal security in its capital. It cannot do this if foreign forces remain in or near Beirut. With this goal in mind, I have consulted with our French and Italian allies. We have agreed to form a new multinational force similar to the one which served so well last month, with the mission of enabling the Lebanese government to resume full sovereignty over its capital. The next day, Amin Jamal was elected president by parliament and was sworn in on September 23rd, with a much larger majority than Bashir had a month earlier. In the beginning, Amin would be more popular in West Beirut and among Muslims of Lebanon, and the Lebanese forces refused to pass on their loyalty to him. They would both eventually realize they were each other's best options. Foreign governments began pressuring the Israelis to pull out of Beirut, who did so by September 29th. The Western powers began sending their forces back into Beirut to protect the Palestinians. The Lebanese army would also enter West Beirut. Amin Jamal would go on a world tour, visiting the US, France, Italy, and Saudi Arabia. The Reagan administration tried to pressure Amin to open negotiations with Israel, believing it would fast-track the withdrawal of the IDF from Lebanon. The Lebanese forces, now under the leadership of Fadi Afram, publicly called for a treaty with Israel, but Amin refused, fearing hostility from neighboring Arab states, as well as from Muslims within Lebanon. He would engage in indirect negotiations with Israel, using the U.S. as a mediator. Amin was willing to cooperate on security matters with the IDF, especially in dealing with Palestinian militants, but they wanted the IDF to fully pull out of Lebanon. Along with a treaty, the Israelis wanted to retain bases in southern Lebanon and have the command of southern Lebanon handed to Saad Haddad. Back in June, when the invasion began, a split occurred amongst the Shia in Lebanon and within Amal. The Shia in the southern Bekaa Valley were also enemies of the PLO, resenting them for inciting Israeli reprisals. The Shia in the northern Bekaa Valley, having been protected from Israeli reprisals by the Syrians, were still sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. Within Amal, a split began to occur between the secularists, led by the organization's leader, Nabi Berri, and the Islamists, led by Hussein Massawi. During the Israeli invasion, Barry joined the Committee of National Salvation, headed by then-President Elias Sarkis. This committee had all the big names of Lebanese politics, such as Walid Jumblat, Camille Chamoun, and both Pierre and Bashir Jamal. Musawi and the Islamists saw this as a collaboration with the Israelis, and so splintered off to form their own group, Islamic Gamal. At that same time, Amal's representative in Tehran, Saeed Ibrahim Al-Amin, along with Hassan Nasrallah, would both publicly condemn Barry and announce their separation from Amal. Both would become leaders in the soon-to-be-formed Hezbollah. Since the revolution in 1979, the Iranians had been asserting more influence in Lebanon, especially amongst the Shia. They were competing for influence over the same groups as Hafez al-Assad. The Iranians made appeals to religion, while the Syrians made appeals to class consciousness. The relations between Amal and Iran were already strained before the Israeli invasion. Ayatollah Khomeini was more sympathetic to the Palestinian cause than Amal was generally, especially more so than those in the south. And Khomeini's friendly relations with Muammar Gaddafi in Libya was also a problem for the Shia of Lebanon, many of whom blamed Gaddafi for the disappearance of their former spiritual leader, Musa al-Sadr. 
the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps would deploy 1,500 soldiers to Lebanon to confront the IDF in the south, but by the time they arrived, the Syrians had already pulled back. Assad was fearful that the IRGC would reignite the fighting between the IDF and Syrians. Instead, Assad and Khomeini agreed to have the IRGC train Lebanese militias to confront the Israelis in their stead. One important character we need to know of is Imad Mugnia. He was one of many Shia who joined the Fatah branch of the PLO, and as a young man organized the Student Brigade, who eventually became part of Arafat's 417, the group the PLO would send out to commit acts of terrorism abroad. While in Fatah, he would meet Khalil Wazir, the mastermind of the Coastal Road Massacre that incited the 1978 Israeli invasion. Bugnia was in West Beirut during the Israeli siege, and after the PLO's evacuation, he got more involved in the Shia resistance to the Israeli occupation such as the nascent Hezbollah. In late 1982, Mugnia planned his own attack against the Israelis, and Al-Wazir would provide him with the needed explosives. He would introduce a new tactic into the Lebanese civil war. Mugnia would recruit a childhood friend, Ahmad Kassir. The Israelis were occupying his hometown, where his family still lived. Fearing reprisals against them, Kassir stipulated his participation on the grounds that his identity would be kept secret until the IDF was driven away from his home. On the morning of November 11th, 1982, Kassir drove a white sedan packed with explosives into the entrance of the seven-story building in Tyre that the IDF used as their southern headquarters. The building also held an IDF ammunition storage. The explosion of the car bomb ignited the ammunition, creating an even bigger explosion. 75 Israelis were killed, along with 15 Lebanese and Palestinians who were being detained. The tactic of spars had mixed results. I mean, sure, they captured international attention, but they usually weren't very successful in terms of the number of Israeli casualties. About half the time, the only person who ever died in the was the for themselves. Even more surprising is that most of the were conducted by secular militias and terrorists rather than the religious ones. After a while, all these groups tried to one-up each other, but this rarely resulted in more Israeli deaths. Hezbollah was more sparing in its use of It preferred to have fewer, but more successful attacks. On November 21st, units from Islamic Amal stormed the government and army buildings in Baalbek, expelling the Lebanese army from them. The army barracks became the new headquarters for the Revolutionary Guards in Lebanon. Fighting would break out between Lebanese forces and the Druze in the Shuf Mountains east of Beirut, as the Lebanese front tried to get Maronites to resettle in the mountains. The Druze were angry with the IDF presence in the region, but the IDF remained largely aloof due to the sizable presence of Israeli Druze within the IDF. Late in 1982, the Soviets had begun rearming the Syrians after their defeat to the Israelis, providing them with the latest model Soviet arms, including new surface-to-air missiles. The Israelis, who had threatened to go to war over Syria's arms buildup the year before, were no longer in the mood or the position politically to threaten war again. By December of 1982, the American, French, and Italian forces were still in Beirut. As the Israelis began withdrawing further south, they had two options, ally with the Shia, who shared much of their animosity toward the PLO and the Palestinians, or continue siding with the Southern Lebanon Army. The Israelis chose Haddad and the SLA. The Southern Lebanon Army, although primarily Christian, did recruit Shias into their ranks, but they also instituted their own taxes on vehicle registration, sand, and gasoline sales. But because Haddad didn't have the legal authority to do this, it functioned more like mafia extortion. The Israelis would also establish the National Guard for the Villages of the South, a militia of locally recruited Shias that was supposed to operate independently of Haddad and the SLA. By February, the IDF managed to force a ceasefire between the Druze militias and the Lebanese forces in the Shouf. That same month, the Kahan Commission issued its report, which recommended the dismissal or censure of numerous top Israeli officials, including Ariel Sharon, whom the report found too willing to act on his own, thus forcing the cabinet to retroactively approve what he had already done. Sharon would resign as Minister of Defense in March of 1983. He would be succeeded by Moshe Arens, who would return to Israel after his stint as its ambassador to the U.S. The IDF was in a politically weakened position and couldn't throw its weight around like it had in the past. As the new defense minister, Arends was charged with implementing the reforms recommended by the Kahan Report, which meant replacing numerous officials. It became clear to me that he and many others had assumed that the recommendations of the Kahan Commission would not be taken literally. I had decided to follow them to the letter. 
In March of 1983, the Israelis began sending signals that they would be willing to withdraw from Lebanon entirely. Reagan believes this is because of Moshe Arendt's replacing Sharon as Minister of Defense. But we soon learned, tragically, that there were many people in the Middle East who did not want peace, at least not as long as it entailed the acceptance of Israel's right to exist. George Shultz attempted to gain Syrian approval for a peace treaty between Israel and Lebanon, but Assad refused. Assad offered to fully pull out of Lebanon, but only if the Israelis pulled out unconditionally. Unfortunately for the Americans, the same forces trying to get the Israelis to leave would turn their sights toward them. On April 18, 1983, the CIA's top Middle East agent was visiting the U.S. Embassy in West Beirut. A car laden with explosives was driven into the embassy, demolishing the building and killing 63 people, 17 of them Americans, including the CIA agent Bob Ames. On top of the human tragedy, the death of Ames was an intelligence tragedy for the CIA. We don't know yet who bears responsibility for this terrible deed. What we do know is that the terrorists who planned and carried out this cynical and cowardly attack have failed in their purpose. They mistakenly believe that if they're cruel enough and violent enough, they will weaken American resolve and deter us from our effort to help build a lasting and secure peace in the Middle East. Despite the bombing of the U.S. Embassy, the Reagan administration kept up its efforts to negotiate a peace accord between Israel and Lebanon. Secretary of State George Shultz engaged in shuttle diplomacy between Beirut and Jerusalem, with a few stops in Damascus along the way. If Syria was excluded from the diplomatic rounds, Assad did everything possible to undercut progress. But whenever Assad's regime was included, it regarded itself as having gained the upper hand and sidetracked the diplomatic effort with impossible conditions and endless new demands. No matter how we approach them, the Syrians played the spoiler. The US also sought Saudi support, but they didn't believe the Israelis would withdraw, believing this was a war of conquest and was going to turn Lebanon into the North Bank. Schultz hoped that once they got Israel to agree to withdraw, the Arab states would pressure Syria to do so. The U.S. was only able to get the Israelis and Lebanese to agree to the accords by spicing it up with secret side deals between the U.S. and each individual party. Schultz promised the Israelis that the U.S. would not force them to fully withdraw from Lebanon until the Syrians had done so. And they also promised President Jamal to help regain control of Beirut and eventually the country. On May 4th, Schultz is able to get the Lebanese to agree to the drafted accords. And by May 5th, the final version of the agreement is presented to Begin's cabinet, who approves it on May 6th. Schultz took the agreement to Assad, who, as expected, rejected it. While the negotiations were going on, the fighting in Lebanon began to escalate. The ceasefire between the Druze and Christians in the Shouf broke down, as the Jews, armed by the Syrians began attacking Christian settlements and shelling East Beirut with Syrian-provided artillery. The Druze also began firing at the multinational forces stationed around Beirut International Airport, to which the U.S. Marines were not allowed to fire back. On May 16, 1983, Lebanon's parliament voted in favor of the accord 64-2. They were called the Agreement on Withdrawal of Troops from Lebanon. The final version called for respect for territorial sovereignty, an end to a state of war, withdrawal of the IDF, with a secret provision letting the Israelis patrol the Lebanese side of the border, that they would settle disputes by peaceful means, and that neither of them would allow their territory to be the staging ground for hostile parties to launch attacks at the other, or allow the military of a third party that is hostile to the other to traverse through its territory. They also agreed to have the Lebanese army and UN observers patrolling southern Lebanon. But no Middle East episode ends with complacency. There were soon indicators, which taken together, were most serious, that the Soviets and Syrians were determined to see that the region remained a tense and dangerous place. A conference in Zagarta, backed by Assad and consisting of many of the political players in Lebanon, denounced the accords and called for resistance to them. Full diplomatic relations would not commence until the IDF had fully withdrawn from the country. However, they would be allowed to set up diplomatic offices in Beirut until then. But President Amin Jamal delayed his signing of the treaty, withholding his approval until the Israelis fully complied. Another ceasefire between the Druze and Lebanese front was reached, and the talks between Walid Jumbla and Amin Jamal saw the Druze demanding not only the previously stated political reforms, but also the abrogation of the accords. 
In August, the ceasefire in the Shuf between the Druze and Christians breaks down again, and the Druze resume shelling East Beirut. At the same time, Amal militia south of West Beirut begin clashing with the Lebanese army. As things were falling apart, the Lebanese forces re-established their barracks in East Beirut, as shelling from the Druze in the Shuf intensified. It had been three months since both the Israeli and Lebanese parliaments had approved the accords, but President Jamal withheld approval, which prevented the accords from going into full effect. Amin had withheld his signature from the law in order to incentivize the Israelis to leave, but without a guarantee of peace, diplomatic recognition, or at least the withdrawal of Syrian forces, the IDF didn't want to fully pull out of Lebanon. Since the president was holding the accords hostage, the Israelis decided to withdraw its protection from the government and redirect its resources to the Lebanese forces and the southern Lebanon army. Two days later, the fighting in the Shuf intensified further. The only thing keeping a lid on it had been the continued presence of the IDF, who were caught in the crossfires between the Druze and the Christians. The IDF were only a few days away from their scheduled withdrawal from the region, but President Reagan planned to ask the Prime Minister to delay it. But before he could send the request, Menachem Begin announced his resignation. Between the ongoing pressure of the war, attacks on his government from the opposition, and the heartache of losing his wife the year prior, he had had enough. The two main candidates to succeed him were his foreign minister, Yitzhak Shamir, and his deputy prime minister, David Levy. Shamir, the more senior of the two, would win the leadership election, succeeding Begin as prime minister. Meanwhile, the government in Lebanon, under increasing pressure from both the Druze and Amal militias, was insinuating that they would not uphold the agreement with Israel. Under the leadership of Shamir, the Israelis were also voicing their intention to unilaterally withdraw from the Shuf ahead of schedule. I saw it as a capitulation to Syria without receiving anything in return. Formerly, our problem had been with an overly aggressive Israel. Now it is with an all too passive Israel. On August 30th, the Syrian-backed militias were shelling the Beirut International Airport, with some of the shells landing near the French and Italian embassies. Amal militias were in Beirut and began surrounding the hotels where U.S. officers and advisors were staying. At this point, Prime Minister Shamir agreed to delay the Israeli departure from the Shuf a few extra days. The few extra days in the Shuf would prove fruitless as the IDF withdrew on September 4th, pulling back to the Owali River. This left nothing standing between the Druze militias, backed up by 2,000 men of the Palestine Liberation Army with the Syrians, and the Lebanese Front, backed up by the Lebanese Army. The fight happened on three fronts, at Bamdoun along the Beirut-Damascus Highway between the Druze and Lebanese Front, and at Souk al-Garb and Kaldeb between the Druze and Lebanese armies. The fighting resulted in tens of thousands of refugees fleeing toward Beirut. The towns of Deir al-Kamar and Biet al-Din were besieged and looted. President Amin ordered segments of the Lebanese army to enter the battle, but the portions of the army consisting of Druze soldiers and officers either defected or mutinied. President Amin called on the Americans for support. On September 17th, the U.S. began firing back at Druze and PLA targets in the Shuf from warships stationed in the eastern Mediterranean. The French would follow the U.S.'s lead with airstrikes of its own. The Druze began firing rockets at Italian and French positions in Beirut, to which the French responded with additional airstrikes. On September 23rd, the U.S. secured a ceasefire with Assad, but this didn't stop the Druze and Amal militias from linking up around southern Beirut. With the ground situation deteriorating, George Shultz began contacting congressmen in order to get more resources, reaching out to Senate Majority Leader Howard Baker, who agreed to help. By September 29th, both houses of Congress voted to allow the Marines to stay in Lebanon for another 18 months. They would be gone in five. As things cooled down for the Americans around Beirut, fighting was heating up in the south between the Israelis and the local Shia population. On October 16, 1983, an Israeli jeep patrol was passing through the town of Nabatia. The commanding officer had been warned, but they decided to drive through the village during the Shiite holiday of Ashura. The streets were crowded with mourning processions, and the sight of the Israelis intruding was seen as an act of sacrilege. The crowd mobbed the vehicle, throwing rocks with additional gunfire in the background. Someone in the crowd lobbed a grenade at the passengers in the jeep. The IDF soldiers opened fire, killing one man and injuring ten others. When the patrol made it back to base, the IDF officers were horrified at what happened and placed the patrol commander under arrest. But this act of discipline would be undermined the next day when SLA militiamen stormed into Nabatia and conducted a house-to-house -house search for the people who attacked the Israeli convoy. The Shia clerics in the south had been politically on the fence throughout Israel's invasion of Lebanon, 
considering they had their own beef with the PLO. But after this incident, most of them would begin to take the anti-Israeli side. The Shia militia the Israeli set up would collapse due to desertion. Things would begin to heat up again around Beirut in the fall of 1983. On October 23rd, the U.S. Marine barracks in Beirut were hit with a car bomb, even bigger than the one that hit the embassy back in April, this time killing 241 U.S. Marines. But I think we should all recognize that these deeds make so evident the bestial nature of those who would assume power if they could have their way and drive us out of that area that we must be more determined than ever that they cannot take over that vital and strategic area of the earth or for that matter any other part of the earth. Hezbollah has always publicly denied their involvement in this or the embassy bombing, but the organization has praised these attacks since the very beginning, and former members have been interviewed and they have revealed that yes, Hezbollah was in fact involved in both of them. On November 4th, the IDF's new headquarters in Tyre was hit by a car bomb. It crashed the gates and 400 pounds of explosives were detonated, killing 29 Israelis and demolishing the building. In retaliation, the Israelis launched an air raid against the IRGC training camp at Janta, killing about three dozen Hezbollah and Iranians. This was the first Israeli air raid in Lebanon targeting the Shia. Israeli casualties began to increase in tandem with the rising rate of attacks. IDF bulldozers destroyed stone or cinder block walls along the coastal road and uprooted orange and lemon trees and banana groves to deprive the resistance men of cover to launch attacks. Back in Beirut, opposition forces were demanding Jamal's resignation, and fighting broke out between the Lebanese army and the alliance of the Druze and Shia militias. This would force the U.S. to intervene again to preserve the Lebanese military. The U.S. responds to the Syrians firing on a recon flight the day prior, but two U.S. planes are shot down. One of the pilots, Lieutenant Robert Goodman, was captured and held prisoner by the Syrians. Additionally, eight Marines were killed by artillery from Syrian positions. The U.S. retaliated by shelling Druze targets in the Shouf Mountains. The Lebanese army and Lebanese front would shell the Shia suburbs of Beirut, killing an additional 300. Goodman was released by early January, but the Syrians hardened their position as popular backlash against U.S. involvement in Lebanon grew. Congressional Democrats, led by Tip O'Neill, were now pushing for a withdrawal of the Marines. I was convinced that Syria and Lebanese opposition now believed that Congress would eventually force a U.S. pullout, and that this had been a primary factor in Syrian intransigence during December. The debate over Lebanon within the White House was more intense than ever. George Shultz and Donald Rumsfeld were still arguing in favor of the U.S. presence, believing that retreating now would be showing weakness to tyrants and terrorists. But Caspar Weinberger and Vice President Bush both argued in favor of pulling out, believing that without sufficient popular support from the public and political support from Congress and the international community, Lebanon was a lost cause. In February 1984, fighting broke out between the Lebanese army, allied with the Lebanese forces, against the Muslim, Druze, Amal, and Hezbollah around West Beirut. The U.S. intervened on behalf of President Jamal, shelling Druze and Syrian positions in the Shouf. Muslims and Druze in the Lebanese army began to defect en masse. I believed in, and still believe in, the policy and decisions that originally sent the Marines to Lebanon. The purpose of having our troops and those of the other three nations in Beirut was to help keep the peace and to free the Lebanese army to go after the various militias and warlords who were terrorizing the country. We never had the intention of getting involved in Lebanon's civil war. If we walked away, we'd also be giving up on the moral commitment to Israel that originally sent our Marines to Lebanon. On February 7th, 1984, President Reagan announced the withdrawal of American troops from Lebanon. And shortly after, America's partners, France, Italy, and the United Kingdom also withdrew their forces from Beirut, leaving Amin Jamal and his government to the mercy of Hafez al-Assad and his proxies. Druze and Shia militias took control of all southern routes out of Beirut, cutting the capital off from the presidential palace in Babda. The palace would be besieged by Sunni militias, and on February 17th, President Jamal agreed to abrogate the accords with Israel, with the Lebanese parliament officially doing so on March 4th. And with Amin Jamal thoroughly subjugated, Assad did what he had done many times before throughout the Civil War and call for another reconciliation conference. Well, the delegates met and they couldn't come to any agreements on political reforms that could end the Civil War. And the Americans were also not done fighting in Lebanon, despite the fact that they had pulled out in February. 
State-sponsored terrorism had by 1980 become a weapon of unconventional war against the democracies of the West, taking advantage of their openness and building on political hostility toward them. The hurried withdrawal of Marines from Beirut in February 1984 left a clear message, terrorism works. And when terrorism works, one consequence is assured, far more lies ahead. After the death of Bob Ames in the embassy bombing of 1983, the CIA sent in Bill Buckley to rebuild U.S. intelligence operations in Lebanon. But on March 16, 1984, a month after the withdrawal of U.S. forces, he is abducted by members of Hezbollah. Back in Langley, they feared not only for his physical well-being, but also for the classified information he had getting into the hands of terrorists and their backers. They had turned the systematic kidnapping and torture of innocent Americans into an instrument of war that was meant to persuade us to abandon our policies in the Middle East. I learned, as had President Carter, how helpless the head of the most powerful nation on earth can feel when it comes to the seemingly simple task of trying to find and bring home an American citizen held against his will in a distant land. On top of the growing trend of foreigners getting kidnapped in Lebanon, the CIA had all of its other Cold War operations to keep on track, including the arming and funding of the Contra rebel group in Nicaragua, which ran out of funds in early 1984, and Congress had forbidden the CIA from diverting additional funds or from asking third parties to fund their ventures in Latin America. CIA Director Bill Casey felt personally responsible for Buckley's kidnapping, but was considering all options available to free him. Over the next two years, these two tasks would morph into one. Reagan was preoccupied with the fate of the hostages and could not understand why CIA could not locate and rescue them. He put more and more pressure on Casey to find them. Reagan's brand of pressure was hard to resist. No loud words or harsh indictments, none of the style of Johnson or Nixon. Just a quizzical look, a suggestion of pain, and then the request, we just have to get those people out. Repeated nearly daily, week after week, month after month. Implicit was the accusation, what the hell kind of intelligence agency are you running if you can't find and rescue these Americans? If Hezbollah believed someone they kidnapped was working for a foreign intelligence agency, they would be interrogated and tortured. And for their safe return, they would make outlandish demands, such as getting Israel to release a thousand or more prisoners in exchange for a single non-Israeli intelligence official. Knowing the Western powers would never acquiesce to it. But Hezbollah never intended to release these captives, especially after they had tortured them. Doing so would have given proof to the West of their inhumane practices, which could isolate the group internationally, making it harder for them to operate abroad. The U.S. suffered another car bombing on September 20th, hitting its new embassy in East Jerusalem, killing eight people. One of Hezbollah's front groups, the Islamic Jihad Organization, took credit for the attack. The terrorists had trained at the Sheikh Abdullah Barracks, which housed the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps in the Bekaa Valley. The attack was done in response to the U.S. vetoing a U.N. resolution condemning Israeli policy in South Lebanon. The kidnappings would continue throughout the rest of the 1980s, but for the people of Lebanon, they were merely background noise in the ongoing civil war. On April 9, 1984, a ceasefire between all of the Lebanese factions was declared. Amin Jamal would visit Damascus, and upon return, he inexplicably began supporting the Lebanese National Movement's proposals from the Reconciliation Conference back in March. But the Lebanese forces rejected these reforms until it succumbed to pressure from the Jamal family. The ceasefire allowed the army to begin clearing up roadblocks in West Beirut and repairing the international airport. The army attempted to enter the Shouf, but the Druze militia refused to let them in. President Jamal wanted to consolidate his position and disarm the Muslim and Druze militias prior to making political reforms, while the militias wanted the reforms made before they disarmed. Down in southern Lebanon, the Israelis and southern Lebanon army were fighting an insurgency of the local Shia population. On February 16th, a prominent Shia cleric, Sheikh Regeb Harb, was gunned down by SLA militiamen. The cleric had earlier predicted that he would die at the hand of the Israelis, and his assassination by the SLA was interpreted as a fulfillment of this prophecy. In revenge for Harb's death, Hezbollah orchestrated another suicide bombing of Israeli forces. Near Deir Kanan, a car bomb was driven between two Israeli personnel carriers, killing six soldiers. This was the first suicide bombing that Hezbollah took credit for. The war continued to grow unpopular in Israel because mandatory conscription ensured that every citizen of fighting age served a tour in Lebanon. They were shot at or hit by roadside bombs, never knowing when or where they might be attacked from. They would often indiscriminately fire into groves and orchards, hoping to scare off or take out an enemy before they could get killed. You see the change first of all in the eyes of the soldiers. It's a look that reminded me of the look in the eyes of American soldiers I saw in the final stages of Vietnam. It is the look of soldiers and officers who know that their chances of winning in Lebanon are less than zero. 
In Lebanon, you can see an army that has experienced firsthand how military might is rendered impotent. On top of the war going poorly, the economy was also dragging down the government of Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir. Three members of his governing coalition defected from the majority in order to vote with Labour in a vote of no confidence, which forced new elections to be called for in July of 1984. Prior to the election, Likud held 48 seats and Labour held 47, neither possessing a majority. After the election, Labour retained 44 seats to Likud's 41. This gave the Labour Party's leader, Shimon Perez, the right to form a governing coalition. But there weren't enough left-wing seats in the Knesset to form a government. So he and Shamir agreed to form a coalition between Labour and Likud. They agreed to split cabinet offices between the two parties for four years, and halfway through swapped prime ministers, with Perez serving from 1984 to 86, and Shamir taking over from 86 to 88. Perez had campaigned on ending Israel's occupation of Lebanon, and insisted that Labour hold the prime ministership first so they could work on withdrawing from Lebanon, along with other foreign and Palestinian policy priorities. Back in Beirut, the ceasefire begins to break down in July. Fighting between the Druze and Lebanese forces happens again in the Shouf, and a rumor about the Saudi government not granting visas to Shias for the Hajj sparked violence in West Beirut between Shia and Sunni militias. In August of 1984, Pierre Jamal, founder and leader of the Falange Party, died at the age of 79, leaving Amin Jamal to take over. He initiated a purge of its ranks, which created discontent among members of the Lebanese forces, who would begin to assert more independence. A standoff was brewing between the Lebanese army and the Druze militia, commanded by Walid Jumblat. He continued to refuse passage to the Lebanese army through any of its territory without Jumblat's political reforms being implemented. Amin Jamal had to get aid from the Syrians to clear up the blockade set up by the Druze and Lebanese forces along the Beirut Tripoli Highway. So currently in the narrative, we have a civil war between Muslims and Christians around Beirut. We have the Shia fighting against the Israelis in the south. But there is another conflict overlapping these two going on that a lot of history books on this subject kind of ignore, and that is a civil war amongst the Palestinian exiles. Between late August and early September 1982, Yasser Arafat and the PLO were evacuated from Lebanon, or at least they were supposed to be, but obviously they weren't. Arafat and 8500 PLO were evacuated, and they were distributed across a number of willing Arab countries, with Arafat relocating to the PLO's new headquarters in Tunisia. Some of them, however, made their way to Syria, and subsequently back into Lebanon. Arafat was afraid of the PLO getting split up between all these countries, because it risked him losing control over the organization, which was the only reason anyone on the international stage took him or the Palestinian cause seriously. Well, in northern Lebanon, a rival began to challenge him for control of the Palestinian exile community. Said al Maraga was a captain in the Jordanian army who defected in 1970 to join the PLO. He builds up his own power base among the anti Arafat factions, many of whom are now being supported by Assad. Fearing this rival might strip him of his power and recognition abroad, Arafat violates the agreement he made with the United States and returns to Lebanon in May of 1983 arriving in the port city of Tripoli. When he arrives, he announces the expulsion of al-Maraga from the PLO and rallies his supporters to his cause. Maraga is unfazed, as he brings his supporters along with him, consisting of the more secular leftist Palestinian factions, and organizes his own group, Fatah al-Intifada. On November 3, 1983, the fight between Arafat and Maraga in Tripoli entered its climactic confrontation. The remnants of the PLO, aided by a local Sunni militia and, quite ironically, receiving arms from the Falangists, fight against Fatah al-Intifada and other anti-Arafat Palestinian groups, including both the Popular and Democratic Fronts for the Liberation of Palestine. Assad decided to tilt the odds in Maraga's favor by placing Syrian units on the anti-Arafat side. By November 26th, the Battle of Tripoli was over, and a ceasefire between the PLO and the Syrians was achieved. A second evacuation for Arafat and his followers would be conducted in December, delivering 4,700 of Arafat's loyalists to Algeria, North Yemen, Tunisia, Sudan, and Iraq. But by October of 1984, there were reports of the PLO beginning to rebuild their strength in West Beirut and within the Palestinian refugee camps south of the city. They were supported by Mutar Batum, a local Sunni militia. Amal and other Shia militias feared the return of the PLO, not only because of their own history with the group, but because they feared losing the power they had gained due to the PLO's absence. Meanwhile, Israel was trying to draw down its involvement in Lebanon, 
On January 14th, Defense Minister Yitzhak Rabin submitted a plan for withdrawal of forces from Lebanon. The Likud members of the cabinet initially resisted, but the Likud Minister of Housing voted in support of the plan, allowing Rabin and Perez to move forward. It was a two-faced plan, the first of which called for building up the SLA strength by recruiting additional members, increasing its arms budget, and building up its fortification infrastructure. The second phase was to pull back the IDF while dismantling the fortifications it had built up for its own use. The ultimate plan was to withdraw from all of Lebanon except for a strip of land along the border with Israel. It was basically reconstituting the good fence policy dating back to Rabin's government in the 1970s. The strip would be mainly patrolled by the SLA, with up to 1,000 IDF reinforcing them. The Israelis hoped that their withdrawal announcement would reduce the number of attacks, but they actually increased. The IDF had faced about 50 attacks a month throughout 1984, but in January and February of 1985, they nearly doubled. A pattern emerged. The IDF would be hit by some terror attack, and in retaliation, they would blockade a Shia village. Troops would round up all the males of fighting age in the village and interrogate them while their homes were searched. Indeed, the gratuitous destruction, vandalism, and brutality meted out by the Israeli troops reflected their fear, resentment, and frustration. It was a cathartic lashing out against their unseen tormentors, the ghosts that flitted from wadi to wadi, orchard to orchard, silently plucking the lives of Israeli soldiers before disappearing once again. The first major withdrawal was from Sedon on February 16th. That same day, Hezbollah officially announced its existence in a press conference in West Beirut, where they published their manifesto in the form of an open letter, read by their spokesperson, Saeed Ibrahim Alamin, Amal's former representative to Iran. Two days later, thousands of armed Hezbollah drove down to Sedan from West Beirut to hold a rally, claiming victory against the Israelis, calling Amin Jamal the Shah of Lebanon, and burning down bars and other establishments that went against their brand of radical Shia Islam. On March 2, 1985, the Israelis searched a Shia meeting hall in Maraka, based on tips from a local informant, but found nothing. Two days later, a pair of Amal leaders, Mohammed Saad and Khalil Girardi, meet in the back room of the hall when a bomb planted underneath a desk goes off, killing both of them. Local Amal forces round up and execute the informant, blaming the Israelis for the attack. However, the Israelis deny any involvement, claiming it was probably Hezbollah, who was increasingly aggressive not just toward the Israelis, but also towards its Shia rivals. Knowing what happens later, both of these stories are believable. In April 1985, the Israelis withdrew from Tyre and most of southeastern Lebanon. They also closed their prison camp in Ansar. It released 752 of its detainees, but transferred the remaining 1,167 to a new prison built in northern Israel at Atlit. The Israelis hoped to use the Shia detainees as a bargaining chip to acquire information on the safe return of missing Israeli servicemen. Instead, Hezbollah and other Shia terrorist groups would take more hostages of their own and demand the return of the detained Shia in Israel in exchange for the return of the new hostages. But, as stated earlier, Hezbollah never intended to return any soldier or state official they kidnapped. While the Israelis are dealing with Shia insurgents in the south, the Christians around Beirut are beginning to fracture. Back in February, Amin Jamal had taken over control of the Lebanese front's finances due to it and the Falange being closely linked. To assert more independence, Samir Geja declared the front's independence from the Falange. The ranks of the Falange party were filled with wealthier Maronites, while the ranks of the Lebanese front had been filled with lower middle-class Maronites. Tensions between the poor and wealthy Maronites had been held at bay by charismatic figures like Pierre and Bashir Jamal, but Amin was not up to the task. Another part of this schism had been fostered by the Syrians, who had agents infiltrate the Lebanese forces and encourage it to assert independence from the Falange. Gagia and his faction of the Lebanese forces attempted to bring the IDF or Lebanese army onto his side by provoking a fight with the Muslim militias of Sidon, but it backfired. Instead, Shia and Druze militia arrived to aid the Sunni militias. Gagia was forced to sign a truce and migrate with a large number of Christian villagers in Sidon to the north, losing him authority amongst the Maronites. But this setback doesn't deter Gaja. He tried to gain control of the group through an internal vote, but was beaten by Eli Hobeka, the officer who led the Lebanese front units into Sabra and Shatila after Bashir's assassination. Hobeka would try to gain full control of the Lebanese front himself by relocating those loyal to Amin Jamal to isolated command posts. 
but in order to keep the Syrians off his back, he declared his commitment to Christian unity, national reconciliation, and that he would sever ties with the Israelis, shutting down its liaison office in Jerusalem. This managed to win Assad over. The bombing in Maraka may have drastically weakened the leadership of Amal in the south, but Assad's orders had done plenty of damage on its own. Under orders from Damascus, Amal had begun to attack the PLO and other Palestinians loyal to Arafat and West Beirut. This was known as the War on the Camps, which managed to defeat the PLO around Beirut, but it mortally wounded Amal. In May, they attacked the camps of Sabra, Shatila, and Burj al-Barajina. Amal was joined by Fatah al-Intifada in attacking the Palestinian camps around Beirut, who were loyal to Arafat. By June 2nd, Amal was able to completely overrun Sabra, but at a heavy price. The Palestinians made an alliance with the Druze, who allowed them into their ranks to fight back against Amal. By early June, the IDF had pulled out of Lebanon, except for the security zone along the border, patrolled by the SLA, which was now led by Antoine Lahad since the death of Saad Haddad a year prior. Hezbollah and the Palestinians also fortified their own positions in southern Lebanon. Hezbollah would pick up the PLO's old habit of firing rockets indiscriminately into northern Israel, though not at the same rate, prior to the Israeli invasion in 1982. Hezbollah began to construct bases and secret tunnels across southern Lebanon to hide weapons caches and escape routes. They also began to reorganize themselves, having both guerrilla fighters and a more conventional military arm. They organized local militias made up of part-time fighters, and while not fighting or training, these local militias would plaster their villages with Hezbollah and Iranian propaganda. They organized prayer sessions at local mosques and gave religious instruction, where they would indoctrinate and recruit. They would also attack or intimidate rival militant groups. Hezbollah created its own welfare programs in the areas it controlled, funded by Iran. They would also enforce their strict moral code of conduct in these areas. Between late 1984 and early 1985, more and more Americans would be kidnapped by Hezbollah and its various front groups. On March 8, 1985, a car bomb nearly killed Saeed Mohammed Hussein Fadlala, a Hezbollah leader, but one of his bodyguards, Jihad Mugnia, Imad Mugnia's brother, was killed. Hezbollah blamed the US for the attack, but the CIA denied all knowledge of it. Lebanese intelligence blamed the CIA's use of Mukafaha, a counterterrorism unit of the Lebanese military. The CIA did cooperate with Lebanese intelligence in order to free American hostages, funding the construction of an electronic signal station in exchange for funneling information back to the CIA. They were particularly interested in the IRGC barracks in Balbek, where they believed William Buckley was being held. In May 1985, Shimon Perez met with Michael Leon, a former U.S. official with ties to the CIA. He came on behalf of Robert McFarlane, President Reagan's national security advisor. He wanted everything they talked about to be off the record and to not be an official operation of either the CIA or Mossad. He wanted to get Israel's help in getting U.S. hostages back. Perez briefed both Shamir and Rabin, who agreed to help the U.S. Behind the scenes, the Israelis weren't the only ones offering to help the Americans get hostages returned. Both Yasser Arafat and Hafez al-Assad were offering information or negotiations in order to win U.S. favor. On June 14th, the Trans World Airlines Flight 847 is hijacked by Hezbollah terrorists shortly after takeoff from Athens, Greece. This operation was planned by Imad Mugnia, the mastermind of the Tyre base attack in 1982, as well as the bombing of the U.S. Embassy and Marine Barracks in 1983. They demanded the release of all Shia prisoners the Israelis held in Atlit. During the negotiations, the plane was flown back and forth between Beirut and Algiers, with a handful of passengers being released at a time thanks to Assad brokering the release of over 700 prisoners from Atlit. Around this time, Ronald Reagan's national security advisor, Rob McFarlane, uses contacts with the Israelis to begin back-channel negotiations with the Iranians, hoping they could get Hezbollah and their other proxies in Lebanon to release American hostages. So the accounts I've read dispute whether or not it was the Israelis that reached out to the Americans offering to connect them to the Iranians, or if the Americans reached out to Israelis asking them to connect it. But regardless of which it was, they both had an interest in getting hostages released from Iranian proxies. Frustration and fear that blinded the West in its attempts to deal with Khomeini's Iran and with the new and ghastly phenomena of hostage taking that took root in the Middle East in the wake of the Iranian revolution. Iran's fingerprints could be found on almost every case of kidnapping in the region in the years that followed. The Iranians themselves, without batting an eyelid, would weave an elaborate tissue of lies, denying any connection with, or even knowledge of, 
the various hostage-taking episodes. Neither we nor the Americans were deceived. Now, I don't want this to turn into oops all around Contra, because this subject is still hotly debated to this day, and I doubt we're gonna have a decisive resolution to it anytime soon. In his autobiography, Reagan claims one of the reasons for establishing contacts with Iran were rumors about the Ayatollah's health. He appeared to be circling the drain, and Reagan hoped that establishing ties with the moderates might place the U.S. in a good position to reshape the regime after Khomeini's death. Everyone seemed to be under the opinion that the Islamic Republic was so dependent on Khomeini that it wouldn't survive his passing. We had also spent a great deal of time thinking about possible scenarios for Iran's future once Khomeini was gone. It didn't surprise me when I was told there were moderates in the government who wanted to out the tyrannical theocracy imposed on them by Khomeini and his cohorts. Therefore, Israel's offer to act as an intermediary and help us open a channel to Iran's potential future leaders seemed very interesting. I'll probably make my own video about Iran-Contra at some point in the future, but if you need more context about it right now, I suggest checking out Mr. Beat's video about it. Anyways, the grossly oversimplified version of the story is that the Americans would sell equipment to the Israelis, who would sell their American weapons to a private third party, who would then sell them to the Iranians. The money made from the Iranians would be funneled through some shell companies and eventually make their way to the Contras in Nicaragua. While the U.S. was dealing with the hostage takers, the civil war continued on around Beirut. In June of 1985, the Damascus Plan was unveiled. Syrian troops would re-enter the parts of Lebanon where it had been expelled from years earlier in order to re-establish central authority, now that Amin Jamal was more compliant to Syria's aims. He also halted the war on the camps that he had compelled Amal to wage months earlier. And, of course, another reconciliation conference would be held. By September of 1985, the reconciliation meeting had failed. After a decade of trying to negotiate an end to the fighting with the politicians, Assad changed tactics. If the politicians couldn't stop the fighting, maybe the militias could. He invited the heads of Amal, the Druze, and the Lebanese front to Damascus to hammer out a deal. In reality, Assad probably threatened them, and since he had them in Damascus, it wouldn't be difficult for them to never be seen again. Regardless of the nature of this meeting, they left with a draft of the Damascus Agreement. This new agreement called for the Lebanese army to withdraw from civilian areas of Lebanon and to be replaced by Syrian troops. The militias were ordered to be disarmed and disbanded. The constitution would be amended to abolish religious sectarianism in the government, and the size of parliament would increase from 99 to 142 seats, divided equally between Christians and Muslims. This agreement was unpopular with the Maronites, with both Amin Jamal and Samir Geja allying together against it. This resulted in the Lebanese front splintering between those loyal to Hubeka and those loyal to Geja, and they would hash out these disagreements in the streets and suburbs of East Beirut. Former presidents Kamil Chamoun and Suleiman Frangia also rejected the agreement, the two of them agreeing being even rarer than Jamal and Geja. As fighting reignited around Beirut, Assad restarted the war on the camps to root out any PLO they had missed back in the spring, but they didn't enter the camps alone. Amal would enter the camps alongside the 6th Brigade of the Lebanese Army, which was predominantly Shia. The fighting, however, had inconclusive results. The PLO were allied with the Druze, who responded to the incursion by attacking Amal positions outside the camp with artillery fire from the Shouf. Just to make this more confusing, basically every side here, except the PLO, was being funded or armed by the Syrians. In December, the Druze began their shelling of East Beirut again in order to pressure the Maronite leadership to accept the Damascus Agreement, which was rewritten as the National Agreement to Solve the Lebanese Crisis, but was better known as the Tripartite Pact. This reform proposal called for the establishment of an upper house to parliament, the appointment of a new cabinet, and that all constitutional reforms were to be implemented within a year, which included the abolishment of sectarianism, reducing the votes needed to win the presidency from two-thirds to 55%, and that the president must approve a bill within 30 days when passed by parliament. The army was to be withdrawn from all the cities and reorganized to coordinate with the Syrian military, that Lebanon was to have a special relationship with Syria and defer to its lead in foreign, security, economic, and educational policy and that Syria was to maintain its role and influence within Lebanon without being required to diplomatically recognize it. Most saw the tripartite pact for what it really was, Syrian domination of Lebanon. And aside from Hobeka's loyalists, most of the Christians ardently opposed it. 
In January of 1986, fighting broke out again between Gaja and Hubeika's supporters. Hubeika's forces attacked President Jamal's personal militia, 475, in the Jamal Estates of East Beirut. Jamal and Gaja would join forces to overpower Hubeika and force him to flee Beirut, causing the tripartite agreement to lose its only major Christian backing in the capital. But by February, the Syrians finally returned to Beirut after three years of absence. In September of 1986, Shimon Peres met with President Reagan in Washington, D.C., who had graciously thanked the outgoing Prime Minister for all the help he had given the U.S. in getting American hostages released from the Shia terrorists. But, according to Perez's autobiography, Reagan warned him that too much information about the operation was getting out. It never crossed my mind that North could have been working on his own, or that Schultz was not in the picture, or that Caspar Weinberger, the Secretary of Defense, had his own very strongly conflicting position. I could not know that the authorizations that McFarland said he had were by no means as authoritative and representative as he claimed. On November 2nd, 1986, just two days before midterm elections, David Jacobson, an American hostage held in Lebanon by Hezbollah, was released. That same day, a magazine in Beirut, Al Shira, published an article detailing the trip of Rob McFarland to Tehran and the sale of weapons to the Iranian regime. At this point, the secret funding of the Contras in Nicaragua had not yet been connected to the sale of arms to Iran, so initially this scandal was called Irangate. As I mentioned earlier, this video is not about Iran-Contra. That'll be a future video. In January of 1987, Amal would begin tackling the PLO problem away from Beirut, targeting their last stronghold near Sidon, in the camp of Magdusha. By the end of January, Amal had made the Shatila and Burj al-Barajina camps uninhabitable. The Druze, who were still sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, began to attack Amal positions in West Beirut. They were joined by other Syrian armed leftist factions such as the Progressive Socialist Party, the Communist Party, and the Syrian Social National Party. They fought against Amal and the 6th Brigade of the Lebanese Army for control of West Beirut, and nipping at Amal's heels from behind was Hezbollah. To save Amal from destruction, the Syrian army intervened, attacking the Druze, Palestinians, Communists, and the SSNP. In a somewhat anticlimactic moment, on May 21st, 1987, the Cairo Pact, originally signed between Charles Hulu, Gamal Abdel Nasser, and Yasser Arafat in 1969, and arguably the ultimate cause of both the civil war and the Israeli invasion, was abrogated by the Lebanese parliament. The PLO no longer had free reign over Lebanon. Of course, this was ultimately meaningless, since the PLO was hardly a player in the politics of the Palestinians, much less that of Lebanon as a whole. Despite this, or perhaps because of it, Amal continued its sieges of the Palestinian camps near Tyre in southern Lebanon, but Assad decided to end the campaign. At this point, not only was the PLO no longer a threat to his hegemony over Lebanon, but the constant massacres of Palestinians by Amal and other Syrian proxies was damaging Assad's reputation within the Arab world. Assad's feelings about the Palestinians weren't too far off from most other Arab leaders, being at best annoyed by Arafat and the PLO. But they and the Palestinian cause were still popular amongst Arab citizens. So a ceasefire was brokered, allowing the PLO to be evacuated from their camps and villages near Sidon. No longer needing to fight the Palestinians, Amal decided to strike back against Hezbollah, who had been chipping away at Amal's power for several years and their first major victory was capturing Nabatea on April 7th. Hezbollah would counterattack in May, hitting Amal in southern Beirut, supported by Palestinian fighters and the nearby camps. Amal's leaders also discovered that their ranks had been infiltrated by Hezbollah. Syrian troops intervened to establish a ceasefire. Hezbollah threatened to kill its western hostages if Assad acted against them. Violence intensified. After negotiating with Hezbollah's representatives in Damascus, a ceasefire was achieved. The militias in West Beirut, except for Hezbollah, were to be disarmed, and that Lebanese security would replace the Syrians in southwest Beirut. Assad would restart his war against the PLO by encouraging the Palestine National Salvation Front to attack the Shatila and Burj al Barajina camps. After a month of fighting, most of the civilian residents of Shatila had fled the camps, and the homes were destroyed. On July 8, 1988, a ceasefire allowed the remaining 175 PLO and their families to relocate to Sidon. When this was finished, the Syrians handed over control of southwestern Beirut to internal Lebanese security, in accordance with their agreement with Hezbollah, who redirected its forces towards Sidon to challenge Amal in that region. 
1988 was an election year in Lebanon, and Parliament was scheduled to elect a new president by September 23rd, who at this point was still required to be a Maronite. There were several candidates whose names were being thrown around. Former President Suleiman Frangia was being promoted by Assad, despite constitutional term limits. Along with Frangia, both Eli Hobeka and Samir Geja had presidential aspirations of their own. The most consequential aspirant, however, was General Michel Aoun, who saw himself in the same mold as Fal Jahab, the Lebanese general who became president after the Lebanese Civil War back in 1958. Aoun was first and foremost a Lebanese nationalist rather than a pan-Arabist or Maronite supremacist, and he believed the military was the only institution that could create a unified Lebanon, and Lebanon couldn't be truly unified until the foreign occupiers were gone, and that meant Syria. Nobody believed that a fair election could be held so long as Syrian troops were occupying West Beirut. The first vote was scheduled for August 18th, and President Jamayo asked Aoun to orchestrate a boycott of the election by Christian MPs. If enough of them didn't show up, Parliament wouldn't have a quorum and therefore a vote couldn't happen, and Aoun was successful. The Syrians consolidated their position in West Beirut and planned on taking control of East Beirut before the presidential elections in September. However, the Maronites of East Beirut controlled too many economically vital areas to risk a full-on military assault due to the strength of the Lebanese front. They also held 25 of the 27 surviving Christian members of parliament. The alliance of Gage's Lebanese front, President Jamal, and the Lebanese military were outnumbered by the Syrians and their proxies, but they had sufficient firepower. The flow of arms from Israel to the Maronites had not stopped after their withdrawal in 1985. On top of Israeli aid to the Lebanese front, the Lebanese military began receiving arms from Baghdad. The Iran-Iraq war ended on August 16, 1988, and Saddam Hussein had been holding a grudge against Syria for siding with Iran, so they began to ship their excess arms to the Lebanese Christians as revenge. The Christian alliance with foreign backing was too powerful for Assad and its proxies, unless Assad was willing to engage in total war against the Christians. Foreign governments feared violence intensifying, especially if Parliament failed to elect a new president by September 23rd. The Vatican, the Soviet Union, and Saudi Arabia all feared a constitutional crisis in Lebanon and pressured the United States to resolve it. On September 13, 1988, U.S. diplomat Richard Murphy visited Damascus to hammer out a compromise. The U.S. rejected Frangia, but accepted Mikhail Dahir, a Maronite member of parliament. Murphy would bring this recommendation back to East Beirut. Jamal, Geja, and Patriarch Safir condemned this nominee. They believed that Dahir would be nothing but a Syrian puppet. Jamal met with Assad in Damascus on September 21st, 1988. Jamal proposed that Dahir be elected as president for a transitional government until parliamentary elections could be held, and the reforms passed. But Aoun and Geja made an alliance on that same day, reacting negatively to Jamal's proposal. Syria was also suspicious. The vote scheduled for September 22nd didn't happen because Assad insisted it be held in West Beirut, his stronghold in the capital. At 10 p.m. September 22nd, 1988, President Jamal asked General Aoun to set up a temporary military government. Prime Minister Haas argued that Jamal's decree was unconstitutional and refused to recognize its legitimacy. Antoine Lahad of the SLA pledged his loyalty to this government, which led the Syrians to call it a Zionist project. Michel Aoun was holding the position of prime minister in the military government, which was unconstitutional due to him being a Christian. Aoun was a professional soldier and had no experience in politics and didn't trust any member of parliament, seeing everyone as a potential agent of a foreign power. His only ally was Samir Geja, head of the Lebanese front, which allowed him to consolidate his power base over East Beirut. And of course, his regime was receiving support from both Israel and Iraq, but the alliance was inherently unstable. Although Aoun had the official apparatus of the government, Geja had more practical experience in governance, controlling East Beirut through the Lebanese front. Also, Aoun favored a unitary government that preserved Christian supremacy, while Geja was a federalist, wanting to devolve power to local communities, going so far as to support a partition of Lebanon into separate Christian and Muslim states. Gage's first target, rather than Aoun, was former President Amin Jamal. The Lebanese front were fighting Jamal's 475 and had placed him under house arrest. Gage forcibly integrated 475 into the Lebanese front and took over the Jamal family estates in Bekfia. On October 22nd, Amin Jamal was allowed to leave Lebanon, going into exile in France. 
With the Jamiles gone, the only power base of the Maronites were the army and the Lebanese front. Patriarch Saphir tried to resolve the crisis by preparing lists of candidates for Assad and Haas to consider, but Assad insisted that political reforms were a precondition to any presidential nominees made by the Christians. Syria encouraged Prime Minister Haas to create his own army. Saddam continued sending arms to the Lebanese front and Aoun's Lebanese army, hoping to bait Assad into attacking. The Arab League feared the growing instability of Lebanon would tear the Arab world apart and strengthen Israel. In January of 1989, they created a committee of the foreign ministers of Algeria, Jordan, Kuwait, Sudan, and Tunisia, and the United Arab Emirates to bring peace to Lebanon. But Syria opposed this, not wanting the Lebanon crisis to be Arabized. They also refused to have the Palestinian question or the presence of foreign powers, with the exception of Israel, in Lebanon to be addressed. On February 10, 1989, Prime Minister Haas, General Aoun, and Speaker Hussein Husseini met with the Committee of Six in Tunis. In the meeting, Aoun urged the withdrawal of Syria in order to free up the decision-making process. Aoun didn't tell Geja about what was discussed at Tunis. In anger, Geja set up his own parallel cabinet made up of Lebanese Front, called the National Development Council. This cabinet worried Aoun. He, at the time, was in secret discussions with the Syrians, who promised to pull out of West Beirut and give him a national role in the new Lebanese government if he expelled the Lebanese front from East Beirut. On February 14, 1989, Aoun and the Lebanese army attacked the Lebanese front in East Beirut and North Matin. The Muslim divisions of the army in West Beirut, led by General Sami Khatib, aided Aoun in the attack. After about 80 deaths and 165 injured, Geja accepted a ceasefire and agreed to Aoun's demands, handing over Beirut port, ending Lebanese front taxation, vacating some of the Lebanese front barracks in East Beirut, disbanding the National Development Council, and acknowledging Aoun's political supremacy. On February 24, 1989, Aoun announced that he was now going to shut down all illegal ports, forcing all to use the Beirut port which he now controlled. This would give him a monopoly over the revenue from import taxes, but he halted implementation until after a meeting of the Committee of Six with Lebanon's religious leaders had ended. At this meeting, Patriarch Safir opposed curtailing presidential authority and urged holding a presidential election. The Muslim clerics, however, refused to accept Aoun or grant legitimacy to his regime without an agreement on political reform. On March 6th, Aoun went ahead with a blockade of all ports controlled by West Beirut militias. On March 9th, Aoun's Coast Guard seized two ships headed for the Druze-controlled port to Gia, which triggered fighting between Aoun loyalists and the Druze in Souk al-Garb, with Druze artillery hitting Beirut port. On March 11th, General Khatib declared all West Beirut ports open to all, and joined with the Druze in attacking the Beirut port. Aoun retaliated by closing down the international airport in West Beirut. In response to this, insurance companies refused to cover flights from state-owned airlines in the Middle East, which accounted for 90% of all air traffic in the region. Fighting intensified on March 14th, with both sides using indiscriminate artillery fire against each half of Beirut. Aoun claimed he was fighting a war of liberation against Syria. West Beirut responded to Aoun's coastal blockade with a land blockade around East Beirut. Aoun vowed to drive out the Syrians, even if Beirut were raised in the process and called Syria a terrorist state, holding four million Lebanese as its hostages. Artillery barrages intensified, hitting gas and oil shortages in East Beirut, greatly reducing the energy supply of the Christians. On April 4th, the Lebanese front returned to Beirut to rescue Aoun. The Christians had 30,000 troops, between the remnants of the Lebanese military and the Lebanese front, while the Muslims had 20,000 troops and militia, backed by an additional 35,000 Syrian troops, who occupied two-thirds of Lebanon and the Syrians would aid West Beirut by beginning a blockade of the Christian enclave's ports. Against the wishes of General Aoun, the Falange party leader, George Saad, and other Maronite leaders met with the Committee of Six in Kuwait to end the fighting. Heavy shelling of East Beirut occurred between April 15th and 18th, claiming the life of a Maronite member of parliament, a famous Lebanese novelist, and the Spanish ambassador to Lebanon. Aoun became more vociferously angry at Syria, but this won nobody to his cause. The remaining Maronite MPs met at the home of Patriarch Saphir on April 18th and called for an immediate truce. When Aoun heard about the MPs, he declared them illegitimate. In an interview the same day, he said, We have reached a point where shells do not hurt us anymore. Only one head will be broken, the head of Hafez al-Assad. Compromise was no longer an option.
A truce was called on April 20th, and on April 27th, the committee called for the opening of all ports and roads, and that an Arab observer force be sent in, not consisting of Syrian troops. Aoun approved of this, believing that this would eventually force Syria out of Lebanon. When committee reps arrived on May 3rd, they got both East and West Beirut to agree to open all ports and roads for three months. But on May 10th, the truce broke down because Aoun used the lifting of the blockade to bring in more Iraqi weapons. The Committee of Six would be replaced by the Tripartite Committee of King Fahd of Saudi Arabia, King Hassan II of Morocco, and President Chalji Ben Jadid of Algeria. They were assigned the task of resolving the Lebanese crisis within six months. Working with the remaining Lebanese MPs, the committee focused on getting a new truce into effect, lifting the blockades, and facilitating discussion that could lead to the election of a new president and political reforms. They demanded the withdrawal of Israel from southern Lebanon, but not any withdrawal or drawdown of Syrian forces. Aoun, for his part, had wanted the Arab League to force the Syrians to withdraw while letting the UN deal with Israel. A new truce came into effect in late May, but the ports and roads reopening, allowing commerce once again. In early June, the Tripartite Committee shuttled a diplomat, Lakhdar Ibrahimi, of Algeria between Damascus and Beirut to hammer out a peace agreement. But the truce broke down once again when the Druze and Syrian troops stepped up attacks on Christian ports, which would spread to Souk al garb between June 10th and 11th. In mid-June, it was discovered that Iraq was shipping Soviet SAMs to Aoun through Jordan, which placed Damascus within range of Aoun's army. Assad asked King Hussein of Jordan to stop their transport, but King Hussein refused. When Greek ships were discovered to be carrying missiles headed for Lebanon, Assad asked the Soviets to intervene, as well as asking Hosni Mubarak, who had been turning back Iraqi ships, to block them at the Suez Canal, hence why the Iraqi weapons had to go through Jordan. Mubarak refused to act due to its alignment with Jordan, Iraq, and North Yemen as the Arab Cooperation Council. Assad reached out to the Soviets, informing them that they would attack the Greek freighters headed toward Lebanon. Syrian ships had been attacking foreign vessels headed there for weeks prior, so the Soviets took the threat seriously. They sent an envoy to Iraq on June 29th. At that same time, the U.S. Embassy asked Iraq to avoid confrontation with the Syrians at sea, fearing a fight near Israeli waters might get out of hand. By July 2nd, Saddam was sufficiently pressured to reverse course on sending the SAMs to Aoun. The Syrians continued to attack ships heading for Christian ports. Heavy shelling continued from both sides throughout late July. Aoun refused to comply with any ceasefire made via a reconciliation committee, believing them to be Syrian fronts. On the other hand, Prime Minister Haas believed that Aoun was secretly trying to strike a deal with Assad, circumventing the approval of his government in West Beirut. The conditions in both West and East Beirut were so bad that about 40% of the populations of both fled the capital. World leaders condemned the brutality of the fighting in Beirut, with most condemnation focused on Assad. Saddam took advantage of Assad's declining position to restart his support for Aoun, claiming that Assad was implementing a conspiracy to divide the Arab world. In mid-August, Assad forced another coalition of leftists and Islamic political parties and militias in Lebanon to go to war against Aoun. The UN Security Council convened an extraordinary meeting on Lebanon on August 15th. On August 25th, the Soviets sent Gennady Tassarov to Beirut to meet with Haas, Aoun, and Patriarch Safir, and then met with Saddam Hussein in Baghdad. During this time, Syria refrained from attacking the Christian territory. The war in Lebanon was unpopular within the Syrian military, and he feared his troops falling prey to terrorist attacks by Christians. Syria also feared absolute world condemnation. The U.S. had remained aloof since Aoun's ascension back in 1988. The new U.S. ambassador to Lebanon had not presented his credentials to Aoun or Haas. Because of this, Aoun denied the U.S. Embassy in East Beirut protection, and warned slash threatened that their diplomats might be kidnapped. On September 5th, 1989, Pro Aoun Christians protested outside the U.S. Embassy, surrounding the compound. The ambassador called on Aoun for help, but was refused. The U.S. State Department ordered the staff to be evacuated and shut down the embassy. Aoun now believed that there was no more international aid coming, and therefore he needed to step up the violence. Fighting escalated around Beirut. The Tripartite Committee presented a peace plan, but Aoun rejected it. Assad accepted the plan, as did most other Arab leaders. On September 18th, Christian leaders met with Aoun and begged him to accept the plan, as did the U.S., Soviet Union, and France. On Friday, September 22nd, 1989, Aoun finally accepted the plan. The airport and the roads were reopened, 
and displaced residents began to return to Beirut, but Aoun's political positions hadn't changed. Elections reforms could not take place until the Syrians were gone. 62 of Lebanon surviving MPs would meet in Taif, Saudi Arabia on September 30th, 1989, with Saudi Foreign Minister Saud al-Faisal overseeing the conference and serving as the intermediary between the MPs and Hafez al-Assad in Syria. They discussed the numerous reconciliation proposals made across the various conferences and ceasefires. The Christian MPs were under instructions from Michel Oun to not discuss political reform until an agreement for Syrian withdrawal was made. Muslim MPs, however, refused to link the status of political reform to the presence of Syrian troops, and both sides were confident that the U.S. was on their side. However, it soon became clear that the Christians were living on borrowed time. They had lost their status as the majority sect before the Civil War, and by this point they represented no more than a third of the total population. The MPs would come to several agreements, such as the government bureaucracy and the cabinet offices would be manned by an even split between Christians and Muslims. However, this was to be a temporary measure until all sectarian quotas could be abolished at some future date. The Formulations Committee would draft the National Reconciliation Charter, which was approved on October 22, 1989. It required Parliament to amend the Constitution of 1926 and the National Pact of 1943, and included provisions related to Lebanese sovereignty, the expulsion of the Israelis, and relations with Syria. The presidency would remain a Christian office, but with reduced powers, while the prime ministership remained a Sunni office, and the cabinet was made stronger. Cabinet meetings would no longer be held at the presidential palace in Babda, but instead in the prime minister's office in Beirut. The prime minister would now appoint cabinet members with approval from parliament, and the president could no longer negotiate treaties with foreign powers without prior consent from the prime minister, and can't sign treaties without the approval from parliament. They also agreed to allow Syria to occupy Lebanon for at least two more years after a unity government was formed and constitutional amendments were passed thereby legally legitimizing the continued presence of Syria for the first time since the ADF mandate lapsed nearly a decade earlier. After a new president was elected, the Syrians were to provide the Lebanese government with military assistance if requested, and had to begin a phased withdrawal to the Beka Valley. These proposals became known as the Taif Agreement. The Arab League pledged its support to the National Reconciliation Charter, as did the US, Soviet Union, France, the Vatican, and the United Nations. Saddam Hussein even supported the agreement, and began cutting off its shipment of arms to Aoun. Of course, we know what Saddam was really doing, prepping for an invasion of Kuwait. But that's a story for another time. When news of Taif reached General Aoun, he immediately denounced the charter on the grounds that it failed to meet his preconditions regarding a timetable for Syrian withdrawal. Aoun was isolated in his opposition, with the Lebanese forces, Falange Party, and the reconstituted National Liberal Party led by Danny Chamoun, endorsing the Taif Agreement. Patriarch Safir also endorsed the agreement, calling on the MPs to hold a vote on it within Lebanon so it could be legally binding. On October 24, 1989, a strike in the Christian enclave shut down businesses, banks, and schools, with large pro aoun demonstrations outside the presidential palace. Aoun demanded severe punishment for the MPs that voted for the Taif Agreement, declaring them traitors. Muslims in Lebanon were also upset at the Taif Accords, because the Maronites were allowed to hold on to more power than their 30-40% to 40 of the population justified. The Christian MPs feared violent retaliation, so they went to Paris for safety instead of returning to Beirut. Various foreign officials began calling for a parliamentary session to approve the Accords, but Aoun threatened to dissolve Parliament. The Council of Maronite Bishops and the Falange Party warned that the dissolution of Parliament would undermine the foundations of the Republic. On November 3rd, Aoun demanded that the Christian MPs return to Beirut to explain themselves. That same day, bombs went off at three of the MPs' homes in East Beirut. They refused to return, to which Aoun declared the dissolution of Parliament. Salim Haas's government in West Beirut declared Aoun's actions as illegal. The MPs would meet at the Kulaya airstrip in Syrian-occupied Lebanon on November 4th. They voted in favor of the National Reconciliation Charter and elected Rene Mouad as president. Mouad was an MP from Zagarta, the power base of former President Suleiman Frangia, who had been a reliable ally of Assad and the Syrians. Mouad had even opposed the U.S. intervention in the Civil War of 1958. Aoun dismissed this as an illegal meeting. 
pro Allen demonstrators attacked the home of Patriarch Saphir on the evening of November 5th after his Sunday sermons had denounced Allen's actions. They beat the 70-year-old man to near death and forced him to kiss a portrait of General Aoun. The next day, he fled Beirut and sought shelter in the Syrian-occupied territory. Aoun's supporters continued to attack the property of Christians in Beirut who were known to oppose Aoun. Samir Jiajia would break ranks with Aoun and called on the Lebanese forces to protect the properties and homes of the Falange Party, who were being targeted by the general's mobs. On the Muslim side, the Progressive Socialist Party, Amal, and Hezbollah initially opposed the accords due to the reforms not going far enough, and the requirement for militias to withdraw from the capital, but they eventually dropped their public opposition under pressure from Assad. On November 22nd, President Muad was assassinated by a car bomb exploding near his motorcade. Since Muad had been approved by the Syrians, Saudis, and the US, they were ruled out as orchestrators of the assassination. Aoun's regime and his followers were the primary suspect, considering the presence of an elected president in West Beirut challenged his authority on the international stage. The second suspect were the Israelis, mostly because it would have been suitable revenge to kill Syria's hand-picked president as the Syrians had killed Bashir Jamal back in 1982. The third in line of suspicion were Hezbollah and Iran, who were both upset that Taif didn't allow the creation of an Islamic theocracy and reduced Iran's power in Beirut. To this day, nobody knows who was responsible, and no proper investigation has discovered the culprits. After the assassination, Syrian forces relocated 52 MPs into Syrian custody in Baalbek. Under the watchful eye of Assad, they elected another Maronite MP, Elias Harawi, as president on November 24th. Harawi dismissed Aoun's cabinet on November 26th and ordered him to vacate the presidential palace, but Aoun didn't recognize his authority. Harawi tried to get the remnants of the Lebanese army in East Beirut to switch sides, but to no avail. Instead, this intensified their loyalty to Aoun. There was also a small contingent of Sunni supporters of Aoun as well. Many of them accused the Syrians of orchestrating the assassination or kidnapping of numerous Sunni clerics. And one Sunni cleric, Sheikh Najjar, once said in front of a crowd of Aoun supporters, God is great and Aoun is beloved by God which caught on amongst Aoun's Christian supporters. Syria responded to the growing Sunni support for Aoun by sending in more forces and placing additional pressure on the Christian enclave, to which Aoun responded by declaring on radio that he was willing to compromise when it came to Syrian interests, but that the rights of the Lebanese must be maintained. This increased Aoun's popularity within his enclave. Pro-Aoun demonstrations began performing sit-in protests around the presidential palace in order to form a human shield around the general, so the Syrians couldn't attack without international condemnation. The international community tried to get Aoun to step down voluntarily to avoid bloodshed, all the while trying to calm the Syrians down. Aoun reached out to the Israelis through Antoine Lahad of the SLA and tried to mend fences with the Lebanese forces, who would promise to help defend the Christians if the Syrians attacked. On December 3rd, 1989, President Harawi gave Aoun an ultimatum, leave the palace in two days or the Syrians will attack. This ultimatum would be undermined when some foreign supporters of Aoun, that being 30 members of France's parliament, arrived at the presidential palace in Babda, thus forcing the French and US to try and restrain Assad. From a summit in Malta, both President Bush and Mikhail Gorbachev insisted violence must not be used to resolve the crisis in Lebanon. The Israelis then promised to intervene against the Syrians if they used air power against Aoun, based on one of the various red lines they had unofficially agreed to in the past. The government of West Beirut implemented a strategy to economically throttle Aoun's government by having the central bank block salary payments to Aoun's soldiers. Aoun's propaganda had boosted him up as incorruptible, but on January 3rd, 1990, a Paris newspaper revealed that he had large sums of money in a secret French bank account. West Beirut accused him of diverting funds from the defense ministry and asked the French and American governments to freeze his assets. Tensions had grown between the Lebanese forces and Aoun, and on January 29th, fighting broke out between the two. The US condemned Aoun for the resumption of fighting, but Aoun accused the US of working with Syria to foster the fighting. Neither West Beirut nor Damascus intervened. It weakened both Aoun and Jiajia and caused many Christians to immigrate out of Lebanon entirely, decreasing the Christian share of the population, thus empowering the Muslims further. They also feared that intervening would cause Aoun and Jiajia to put aside their differences like they had numerous times before. 
The Syrians also didn't want Aun to be decisively defeated, because this would empower Giagia as the sole Christian warlord. Assad would allow shipments of food, fuel, and weapons to go through the lines to Aun's forces in order to prolong the Christian infighting. They also allowed Lebanese front militiamen to retreat or launch attacks from within West Beirut. As the fighting continued, support for both Aun and the Lebanese front declined among the Christians. A truce was eventually arranged on February 17, 1990, but resumed on February 25th. The fighting got so devastating that Patriarch Safir threatened to excommunicate any officer who gave orders to shoot, and to any soldiers who followed said orders. Aoun's forces would withdraw from the Lebanese front territory on March 2nd, and on March 4th, another ceasefire was secured. The mediators favored Gia Gia, who had endorsed the Taif Agreement. Gia Gia publicly stated that he would be willing to join the government of West Beirut if he was invited. Aoun would then resume the fighting on March 19th. Gia Gia formally declared allegiance to President Harawi on April 3rd. Harawi was hesitant to incorporate the Lebanese forces into his strategy because they still had more experience in governing than Harawi, and feared the army either playing second fiddle to the Lebanese forces or the Lebanese forces dissolving, thus leaving his army being forced to face off against Aoun's hardened troops. He also had to keep Assad in mind, who held a grudge against Gia Gia for thwarting the 1985 tripartite agreement, as well as the bitterness that still sat between the Lebanese front and Suleiman Frangia, still nursing a vendetta against them for the murder of his son. Gia Gia, for his part, wanted to see Harawi get installed as president in Babda, and then distance himself from Syria. The continued fighting destroyed the economic infrastructure of East Beirut, and during the brief ceasefires that occurred, thousands of Christians would flee East Beirut. Fighting continued through the spring. In late April, Aoun made ground politically with the Maronites, with Danny Chamoun of the National Liberal Party switching sides to support Aoun. In late May, negotiations between the various Maronite factions began. They drafted a proposal for Harawi's government that would call for amendments to the accords, and Aoun offered to join Harawi's government but they were refused. Instead, Harawi called for a complete blockade of Aoun's territory, not allowing currency or fuel in. France and the Vatican urged Aoun to hand everything over to Harawi. For his part, Aoun had stopped mentioning Syrian withdrawal as a precondition to peace, and instead focused on domestic reforms, which Assad found suitable. Assad wanted to keep the Maronites fighting each other, Harawi was also supportive, since he wanted Aoun's army intact, so he could use it against Gia Gia and the Lebanese front. But on August 2nd, 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait, which drastically impacted the situation in Lebanon, while also pulling the world's attention away from it. Syria joined the anti-Iraq coalition formed by the US, and the sanctions placed on Iraq hurt Lebanon, due to Iraq and Kuwait being major export markets for Lebanon. Trade with Jordan and the Gulf states also drastically declined. Additionally, 100,000 Lebanese and Lebanese-based Palestinians working in Kuwait returned to Lebanon, which resulted in the stream of remittances drying up. On top of that, the humanitarian aid that the Gulf states had been sending to Lebanon were redirected towards Kuwait. Inflation would skyrocket, with the exchange rate going from 710 Lebanese pounds to one US dollar to 1,100 Lebanese pounds to one dollar. Despite the ongoing economic collapse, Harawi's government continued on with passing the constitutional reforms laid out in the Taif Agreement. By September 19th, the constitutional legislation was signed into law. With the reforms passed, President Harawi warned General Aoun that he may use force to depose him. The U.S. had expressed some support for the use of force against Aoun after a meeting between James Baker and Assad on September 14th. The U.S. allegedly gave Assad the green light to take out Aoun. Harawi imposed a full blockade of Aoun's territory, receiving backing from the Lebanese front. To avert an attack by West Beirut, Aoun's followers mounted candlelit vigils at the crossing points between East and West Beirut. But an unknown assailant fired on the crowd, killing 25 people. Aoun and most foreign diplomats blamed the Lebanese front, but Gia Gia accused Aoun of orchestrating a false flag attack to win international sympathy. The blockade created a humanitarian crisis in East Beirut, which resulted in France refusing to issue visas to Lebanese citizens if the blockade wasn't lifted. But this had no effect on Harawi's government. Aoun and the Syrians began reinforcing their troops around the Christian territory, and Syria allowed Hezbollah to bulk up their forces in West Beirut as well. Aoun tried to rally his supporters to take up arms, 
but after months of deprivation, there were fewer people willing to heed his call. On October 12th, the Lebanese front clashed with Aoun's troop along the Green Line. That evening, a Lebanese Shia, Habib Hilal, attempted to assassinate Aoun while he was addressing a crowd outside the Babda Palace, but missed. He finished his speech and was defiant in public, but in private, he mentioned his willingness to resign. The Syrians began shelling Aoun's positions in the early hours of October 13th. At 7 a.m., Syrian and Lebanese soldiers launched a ground assault. The Syrians launched bombing raids of the palace, causing Aoun to seek refuge in the French embassy by 8.30 a.m. The fighting continued for another six hours, with Aoun and his officers hoping the Israelis would intervene, but the U.S. had convinced the Israelis to not retaliate against Syrian airstrikes. The Lebanese army captured the palace by 3.15 p.m. There were about 800 deaths that day, but it marked the end of the fighting. The civil war was over. When the Syrian troops entered the palace, they confiscated the computers and records of Aoun's military intelligence, which held thousands of files about any and all prominent Lebanese citizens and residents, an invaluable asset for Syria's continued occupation. The Syrians then allowed the followers of Eli Hubeka, now operating as the Lebanese Forces Executive Command, or the Promise Party, along with the Social Syrian National Party, to enter the densely populated areas of Aoun's enclave and seek revenge. They murdered, raped, and looted the Christians of East Beirut and the surrounding areas. They also began harassing former Falange members and occupying their properties within the Lebanese Front territory. And the new Lebanese army, consisting mostly of Muslims, would move into the areas formerly controlled by the Lebanese Front. On October 21st, masked men in army uniforms entered the apartment of Danny Chamoun and killed him, his wife, and their two children. Syria was accused, since the area was under Syrian occupation. Lebanese troops began dismantling the green line separating East and West Beirut, and residents began depositing what money they had back into the banks as a sign of confidence, which improved the exchange rate of the Lebanese pound by 40% in a single week. Prisoners held by the Aoun government were released. Among those released were Habib Shartouni, the man who had assassinated Bashir Jamal, and Habib Hilal, who tried to assassinate Aoun. Aoun's assets were frozen by the central bank, and when Aoun's family was allowed to leave Lebanon for France, they were caught trying to smuggle out over $200,000 in cash, which was confiscated. The militias were required to leave Beirut, which put Hezbollah and Amal at the risk of fighting again. So Iran and Syria hammered out a peace agreement between them. By November 9th, Amal withdrew from Beirut, sending most of their troops to the Beka Valley. Hezbollah later followed suit, redeploying most of its troops to the south. The Lebanese government allowed the Palestinians to retain their militias, since they were dominated by the Syrian-controlled Palestine National Salvation Front, and were allowed to maintain security inside the camps, but not outside. The government had to negotiate the withdrawal of the Lebanese Front, who refused to fully withdraw from Beirut unless the SSNP and LFEC did so as well. Gia Gia wanted a say in what divisions of the army were allowed where, pointing out that the Druze regions and neighborhoods were occupied by Druze divisions. The government promised to have the property occupied by the LFEC and SSNP returned to the Falange and to not allow them to enter Ashrafia or to be allowed to commit more abuses. The militia leaders were all offered seats in the cabinet with Hezbollah refusing to take theirs due to the government's failure to come up with a plan for expelling the Israelis. Out of fear that his supporters might restart the fighting, Michel Aoun was allowed to seek asylum in France. Beirut was in a dire state. All the strikes by municipal workers resulted in trash piling up around the city. Water and electricity had become scarce, the infrastructure was ravaged, and the world had forgotten about them. But at long last, there was finally peace. The Israelis would continue occupying their security zone in southern Lebanon until the year 2000, when Prime Minister Ehud Barak would fulfill his primary campaign promise to pull Israeli troops out of Lebanon. Five years later, Syria would finally pull its troops out of Lebanon, after the Cedar Revolution compounded with international pressure from Presidents George W. Bush and Jacques Chirac. Israel would invade Lebanon again in 2006 after Hezbollah fighters attacked IDF soldiers patrolling the Israeli side of the border and abducted their bodies back into Lebanon. Israel would withdraw from Lebanon again after one month of fighting. But now let's take a look back and see where many of the characters we covered in the past ended up. President Kamil Shamoun, leader of the National Liberal Party and president of Lebanon during the first civil war in 1958, died of a heart attack in 1987. 
he was serving as deputy prime minister under President Amin Jamal. President Fouad Shahab, the general who became president after the first civil war in 1958 and tried to steer Lebanon between Western and Arab influences, died in 1973. President Charles Hulu, who signed the Cairo Pact that started the second civil war, unlike most Lebanese presidents, retired from politics after his term in office and would die in 2001. President Suleiman Frangia, under whom the Second Civil War started, remained active in politics throughout the war and was a reliable ally of Syria. He would die of acute pneumonia in 1992. President Elias Sarkis went into exile in Paris after his presidency ended in 1982 and would die from cancer in 1985. Amin Jamal went into exile in France after his presidency, but returned to Lebanon in 2005 after the Syrians withdrew. Since then, he has remained active in Lebanese politics. Elias Harawi's presidency would last until 1998, after his presidential term was extended. During his tenure, he tried to foster Lebanese nationalism in order to subvert religious sectarianism. He has been criticized for disarming all of the Muslim and Christian militias except for Hezbollah, which was allowed to continue fighting the Israelis in the south. He died of cancer on July 7, 2006. And what about Michel Oun? Well, like Amin Jamal, he was allowed to return to Lebanon in 2005 after the Syrian occupation ended, and he would finally get his wish to become president of Lebanon in 2016, and is, as of writing this, the current president of Lebanon. Bill Buckley, the CIA mission chief kidnapped by Hezbollah in 1984, was moved between Lebanon, Syria, and Iran for over a year, being tortured by each interested party for information. In June of 1985, his handlers found him dead in his cell and buried him in an unmarked grave outside Beirut. The CIA wouldn't retrieve his body until 1991, finding indisputable evidence of torture. Samir Giagia was one of the most powerful Christians in Lebanon after the defeat of Aoun. Despite his position in the Lebanese government, Giagia continued to oppose Syria's occupation of Lebanon. In 1991, the Lebanese parliament passed a law granting blanket amnesty for any political crimes and atrocities committed by anybody prior to 1990. The only exceptions to amnesty were those who committed crimes against foreign officials. And if they committed any crimes after 1990, then the amnesty would be null and void. In January 1994, Hafez al-Assad's son and presumptive heir, Basel, died in a car accident. Gia Gia attended the funeral in Syria to give his condolences to President Assad. While in Syria, Gia Gia was asked to speak with some Syrian officers, but he refused. The Syrians considered this a violation of the amnesty law, which required the Lebanese to cooperate with the Syrian occupiers. Gia Gia would be arrested after he was accused of orchestrating a car bombing in Zouk Mekel, which killed nine people, as well as the assassination of Prime Minister Rashid Karani and Danny Chamoun despite there being no proof of his involvement in any of them. He would be held in solitary confinement for 11 years. After the Cedar Revolution expelled the Syrians from Lebanon, the parliament passed an amnesty law in 2005 to free Gia Gia and other political prisoners. Since then, he has resumed his leadership of the Lebanese forces political party. Ali Hubeka, the man who led the Falangist militia into the Sabra and Shatila massacres, would also hold the cabinet positions in the Lebanese government after Taif and served as an MP from 1992 to 2000. He was assassinated by a car bomb in the Beirut suburb of Hazmiya on January 24, 2002. A group calling itself the Lebanese for a Free and Independent Lebanon claimed credit for the death, justifying themselves by saying Hubeka was a Syrian agent. In 2008, Ibn Bukhmiya, the mastermind of the embassy bombings, the barracks attack, and many other acts of terrorism, was assassinated by a car bomb in Damascus. It is suspected that the CIA and Mossad were responsible for the attack, but neither have claimed responsibility. And that was my rendition of the Lebanese Civil War. There are many like it, but this one is mine. Thank you so much for watching. If you're still watching it this long, it's like it's got, I don't even know exactly what the length, total length of it is, because I'm filming. I haven't finished editing it yet. So thank you so much for watching. And I will see you next time.